Thanks on Tuesday, July 16, 2019 at 6.30 p.m. Roll call, please. Mayor Lahousis? Here. Vice Mayor Tierra Penny? Here. Commissioner Sieber is absent and excused. Commissioner Carr? Here. Commissioner Donovan? Here. Thank you. I'd like to uh, remind to everyone that the purpose of tonight's meeting is for the Board of Commissions to study issues, to gather and to analyze information to clarify questions. No votes are conducted during the work session. No public comments will be allowed tonight on the budget. However, will be allowed during the two public hearings that are scheduled for Wednesday, September 4, 2019 and Tuesday, September 17, 2019 at 6.30 p.m. Tonight, we only have one item on the agenda, which is the general fund budget and enterprise funds discussion. Uh, I'd like to uh, recommend that we use the same procedure as we did last year, if you'll remember that. First, we had the uh, PowerPoint presentation given by uh, Ron Herrick, and then will be questions and answers and comments. Then we have the budget advisory committee to give, to give us their recommendation. Then we're going to have a discussion on general fund and enterprise fund. Uh, on August 12th, we'll have the uh, second budget workshop, and then we'll be discussing the CIP, the salaries, Penny for Panelas, the CRA, and any follow-ups that we have from this meeting tonight. Everybody agree with that? Okay. So, Mr. Lacourage, Mr. Hare, you ready for the presentation? Good evening, Mayor Commissioners. Ron Herring, Finance Director, and this is the first meeting of the BIRD Budget Workshop for fiscal year 2020. And I've got a few slides. I'll try to make it quick and go through them so it's not too long. Uh, the budget process has been going on for a little over four months right now, the process to date. You know, in March, we sent out to the, to the departments who entered their budget requests. In April, Finance compiled the budget document and made the revenue projections. Uh, May 16th, 23rd, and 30th, the Budget Advisory Committee met with all departments and went through their budgets. July 2nd, uh, the proposed budget was submitted to the board. And July 16th, tonight, the first budget workshop on the 2020 budget. And uh, if I may, I just wanted to make a little, little shout out to the Budget Advisory Committee. I, I, you know, they went through a whole bunch of new members on it. We, we had the previous board I didn't know you know how they would be replaced and stuff but uh, you know totally new members and all with varying financial backgrounds they, they spent the whole month of May going over the budget they went through every department's budget they met with every department head made expenditure cuts asked a lot of good questions and overall I was was very impressed with them and I know chairman Banther led them and guided them through the process and um, Claire McCoy is here. He was one of the one of the budget advisory committee members, but I, I think they did a great job and stuff, you know. But I just wanted to have that little shout out for him there. Um, what you got? You got two budget books, and you probably maybe you're used to them. One's this big three ring binder here, which you know has all the detail, basically four reports: the revenue, the t expenditures, justifications, and personnel schedules. I just mentioned that if you're looking for something, there's a good table of contents that narrows down where everything is. And at the bottom, I just mentioned there that you can find the, the budget books on the, uh, on the city website under finance, under the budget. Uh, getting into the executive summary, which was this book here. Uh, you can find a lot of these pages in the table of contents, but I just wanted to highlight the budget message, which was one I just created in, in the last month. And what it does is try to highlight, it's a new report in there, and I just try to highlight in those 10 pages uh, some of the stuff that's in the budget book with the different funds and the different, uh, could explain the variances in the funds. Another part of the executive summary is the uh, CIP with the page numbers there. And I just wanted to highlight, if you're looking for all the CIP projects, if you, like the first highlighted one, pages 98 through 100, those three pages have all the CIP projects for the five years right there, if you're looking to see everything. Uh, a lot of the other reports down the line there are the separate funds that make up the CIP that are back there, and then on the bottom is a capital outlay for smaller equipment on pages 115 to 116. And then getting into the budget document, as you can see, the total city budget is uh, 63 million. It's a uh, $6 million um, increase over the um, 
2019 budget are 10.4 percent. Uh, just tried to show the five largest funds, which are the General Fund, Water and Sewer Sanitation, Stormwater, and Penny. They make up almost 58 million or 90 percent of the total city budget. Um, trying to break down General Fund is 5.2. They had a 5.24 percent increase. And over here, trying to explain briefly what it is: it's salary, benefits, and repairs and maintenance. Water and sewer, 12.3 percent increase. A lot of capital projects, salaries, and electric. Sanitation fund, 6.58% between capital and salaries. Stormwater fund, 136%. That's mostly the, the big Pent Street capital project, uh, 2.4 million, which is charged to the stormwater fund. And then the penny fund, about 5.76% increase. It's capital projects. The budget assumptions in the budget, all funds are balanced, a general fund balance without using unassigned fund balance, no new positions in the budget, salary increases, we funded the general employees at 3%, police and fire union employees per the contract, health, dental, and life, we've estimated 10%, we don't have the final numbers, we might not get those until August. Workers comp, we estimated 10%. Property insurance, 10%. Retirement accounts for police and fire defined benefit, we, we uh, did them per the, uh, what the actually required, per the actuary, the annual required contribution. And general employees defined contribution plan is at the 8.7%, which hasn't changed in a number of years. Uh, some major revenue items, the millage rate is unchanged at five, in the budget is at 5.42. The property tax, taxable values increased 6.44% as provided by the property appraiser. CRA property tax, taxable values increased 1.29%. Some other major taxes like penny tax, half cent sales tax, revenue sharing, I've estimated between 2.5 and 5% depending on the tax. Water sewer reclaim rate increases at 2.75%. That's the approved uh, rate increases. Uh, sanitation rate is per the contract at 1.78%. It's based on the CPI. Stormwater increase is at the 50 cents, which brings the uh, to $8.15 per equivalent stormwater unit. And like I say, these rate increases are approved by resolution or contract. Other notable new or operating expenditure increases, we've got the health insurance plan consultant. We put some money in for that, 100,000. CRA plan update, 75,000. Electric cost increase at the water plant, 101,000. Electric for street lights, 52,000. City hall genera generator lease, 75,000. Some fleet commercial repairs increase, 86,000. IT maintenance costs, about 71,000. and. Those right there are of the increases are 561,000. Getting into the general fund, uh, the general fund budget is 26 million. It's a $1.3 million increase or 5.24%. Uh, no unassigned fund balance is being used to balance the general fund. Uh, trying to break down the expenditures by category and just trying to show that personnel services increased 829,000. That's the largest increase. Operating was 408,000 over the previous year. And down below, just trying to graph it and show personnel services is 73% of the general fund budget. Operating is 23%. And then down here, we graph it with 73, 23, and the 1.6 capital. Uh, major expenditure increases in the general fund is personnel services, about 829,000. Operating services, the health insurance consultant, it's total 100,000, but we're dividing it between 100,000, I mean, sorry, 70,000 general fund, the other 30,000 is in the water and sewer fund. City hall generator, it totals 75,000, but we're, we got 60,000 where we've apportioned to the general fund, 15,000 we'll see coming out of the water and sewer fund. Property insurance general fund portion is 38,000. Repairs and maintenance for IT, a lot of it is something new this year. The Microsoft MDM 365 is 71,000. Electric for street lights, we've had some LED maintenance and we have 70 new street lights on Highway 19. And we also, there's been a 2.5% increase in electric cost that Duke has provided us. Uh, fleet commercial repairs, mostly for police, fire, and streets. We've had to increase that 77,000 for total operating increase in the general fund of 369,000. And then the, I'm sorry, the safer grant, the, the four paramedics we started about two years ago, there's an increase. We've gone from the first two years where the um, 
city had to pay 25%, uh, the 75% was funded by the um, federal government. But now the third year, the city has to pay 65%, and the other 35% is from the federal government. And then next year in 2021 and beyond, the city's uh, liable for the whole 100% of the four paramedics. So that was an increase of 170, 173,000 in 2020. So that's, that's roughly almost 1.4 million of some expenditure increases. Uh, trying to show the revenues for the general fund, and of course the largest increase is a 621,000 in taxes. Um, and down below, just to show that's 54% of the general fund, and the, then just trying to graph it out, 54% taxes, permits, 8.9. Intergovernment 11.6, charges 11.9, fines and forfeitures, interest, miscellaneous and transfers and restricted reserve. And taxes is not only property taxes, but it's utility taxes, communication service taxes, and the local business taxes. Uh, some of the general, trying to break down the general fund revenue increases, of course, the taxes, property taxes highlighted there, 546,000, utility taxes, mostly electric, 78,000, permits and fees, franchise fees on electric, 138,000, some intergovernmental from the state, the revenue sharing, 42,000, half cent sales tax, 45,000. We got the art celebration grant again this year, 15,000. Uh, library co-op funding, uh, it's increased about almost two, 250,000, so we've had an increase of 27,000. Street light funding, it was, since we have the extra 70 street lights, the state pays us more money. So on, before they paid us on 166 lights, so now we have 236 lights. So our funding went up to about 61,000, so it's an, almost an additional 20,000 the state pays us for maintaining those lights. Uh, county charges for services, we put about 20,000 more for fire services from the county, EMS about 45,000 from the county, and then transfers increased 197,000 for almost 1.2 million in the revenue increases. Uh, just trying to break down the, uh, the taxable value changes to try to show that the taxable values for the sit total city is at 1.9 billion. It's an increase of 116 million, or six, that's 6.44 percent. CRA is 89 million. It's an increase of 1.1 million, or that 1.29 percent. Uh, and just as a reference, the CRA base year is 2001. The CRA goes for 30 years, so the revenue that goes into the CRA is the money over this minimum base amount, that value minus that value times the millage rate is how much goes into the CRA each year from the city, and then we bill the county for their portion. Uh, trying to break down the revenue uh, for the property taxes, uh, we've got this general fund portion, 9.7 million, increase of 546,000, CRA 247,000, an increase of 5,989, and if you want more history on the property taxes, page 50 of the executive summary has a, like 15 year detail there. And I'd like to show this graph every year. Uh, it, it just shows everything that makes up the property taxes. It's got the millage rate here from 5.45 and we've sort of hovered at that until 2017, we reduced it to 5.42 and we're still at the 5.42. The taxable values, you know, we were going up in 2008, we got up to 1.9, over 1.9 billion, and then we took this big dip down here due to the economy down in 2013 to 1.3 billion, and now we're back up to 1.9 billion, almost up to where we were before. When you take millage rate tax taxable values, you get the, the revenues coming in. So the revenues, where we were in 2007, we were at 8.1 million, the revenues going to the general fund. We went down to 6.7 million, and now we're back up to 9.7 million in 2020. Trying to take the slide from the previous slide and try to highlight it a little bit more, but just, just trying to show where we went from the, in the taxable values from the 1.9 million, we went down 33% to that one, almost one, little under 1.3 billion. We're back, we're back almost to where we were Back in 2008, we had a 33% decrease, now we've had a 32% increase. Taking one of those slides from the previous slide on the revenues, like say back in 2007, we were at 8.1 million, we went down to 6.7. 
now we're back up to 9.7 million, and then I had a thought, let me try to figure out, you know, what's been the increase over those years. So from 2007 to 2020, we went up 1.6 million from uh, 2007 to 9.7 in 2020. So we increased 1.6 million, you know, if you average it out, it's 125,000 a year, or 1.52% a year. Always sometimes what we're asked is, uh, you know, the full service cities, population greater than 20,000. Uh, and it's the five cities, it's Tarpon, Pinellas Park, Largo, Clearwater, St. Pete. And we're trying to show the, the tax rate in 2019, the blue bar, and then the red bar is a 2014. And uh, as you can see, Tarpon went down a little bit to the 5.42. Um, Pinellas Park went down a little bit since uh, 2014. Largo went up, Clearwater went up, uh, St. Pete went down just a little bit. So of these five, the largest over 20,000, Tarpon is the lowest at 5.42. And then I was curious, I go, well, you know, of the cities, I go, how many had increases over the last from 2014 and 19? So 50% of Pinellas cities increased their millage rate since 2014, 25% were unchanged, and 25% of the cities reduced their millage rate, including Tarpon Springs. This is the same graph we just looked at with the full service cities down here, but I was asked to put in some other cities, uh, Seminole, Safety Harbor, Oldsmar, Dunedin, and the Unincorporated. And these are cities, uh, well, these ones here with no police department, but uh, Seminole's at 2.47. Safety Harbor went up a little bit, 3.73 to 3.95. Oldsmar's held the same from 2014 to 19. Dunedin's gone up from 3.73 to 4.13, and the unincorporated has remained at 4.96. And then, like I say, down below is the same ones from the previous graph. And then I try to do, like to do some projections going out. And um, I did the revenues and, revenues and expenditures for the last since uh, from 2010 to 18. You know, we average about a 3.26% increase in expenditures. You know, I projected those out. And as you can see, we're pretty close, you know, revenues and expenditures going over these uh, from 2010 to 23. Even in this part, we had expenditures over revenues. And uh, so it's they're pretty close the whole way out there. And this was in balance, we ba this projection was based on balancing the budget through 2023. This is the same graph you just looked at, but I thought it, uh, I mean, I'm just having fun with graphs, I know, but <laughs> I added in the millage right here. So here's the same revenues and expenditures, and here's the 5.42 to say I base the revenue projections on the 5.42 to balance the funds through 2023. I use 5% as a taxable value increase as an average. Sometimes I'm a little, maybe that's a little high, but we have been a little bit higher the last five, six years. Um, so just trying to show that graph. And then I got one more. Same graph, revenues and expenditures with the millage rate I just showed you, but then I put in the unassigned fund balance. So with, with keeping the 5.42 millage rate, and the projecting the revenues, I've been able to, with projecting through 2023, maintain the unassigned fund balance at 8.8 .8 million. Whoops, sorry. Now the water and sewer fund. Uh, the water and sewer fund budget is 20 million, 159,000. That's a $2.2 million increase or 12.3%. That's mostly capital. Um, expenditures by category, and like I just said, it's mostly the capital increase of 1.4 million from 2019 to 20, and down below just trying to show the same sort of graph, a capital outlays 32% of the uh, water and sewer budget, just trying to show, um, and personnel's 28%, operating 22, capital 32, debt 10%. Uh, major increases in the water and sewer fund, uh, personnel 286,000, operating 268,000. Uh, here's the health insurance, the 30,000 for them breaking, you know, split between general fund. City hall generator, 15,000 split with a general fund. The property insurance portion for the water and sewer fund, 27,000. Electric at the water plant, we need an increase of 101,000. Permit engineering, mostly for the sewer plant, 40,000. 
and some additional water sewer repairs maintenance at the water plant, 54,000 for 268,000. And the main capital increase is the sewer, sea breeze drive sewer construction of 1.4 million. So that 1.9, almost 2 million is the big increase in, for the water and sewer fund. Water and sewer revenues, um, 9.3 million projected, 6.2 for sewer, 395,000 for reclaimed. Based on the 2.75% rate increase that's been approved through 2028, uh, these revenues are 79% of the, of the budget. Uh, trying to show the revenues by source in the water and sewer fund, we got 16.7 million of revenues or 83% of the budget. You will see a decrease here. Maybe I'm being a little conservative, but we're seeing a, a, a slowdown in use of the water this year. I think we're down about 4%, so I I'm, I'm might be a little conservative, but I just wanted to be on the safe side, so I budget a little less for water. If it comes in higher, you know, that would be, that'd be good. Sanitation fund, approved budget 5.4 million, a $334,000 increase, 6.58%. Uh, the main revenues are sanitation fees, 3.9 fee, million, recycling 599,000, yard waste 330,000. The rate increase is 1.78%, that's based on the contract with the uh, waste management. Those revenues are 90% 90, 90 of the budget. Rate, like I say, rate increase per the contract using the CPI. Uh, 2020 is the fourth year of the five-year contract with waste management, and there's a city administrative fee of 20%. Uh, the main expenses of the sanitation fund are the contractor expenses. We've got budgeted solid waste, 3.3 million, recycling, 488,000, yard waste, 208,000 for a total of 4 million. Getting into the stormwater budget, it's 3.5 million, a little bit higher because of the Pent Street project, um, over, you know, $2 million over that, 130%. Uh, the stormwater revenues are budgeted at 1.6 million. The, the equivalent stormwater rate will be 8.15. It's up 50 cents per the rate plan that was approved. Their rates are through 2025. Uh, the major increase is the capital, almost 2 million. That's due to the Pent Street, Pent Gross Avenue stormwater project, almost 3.2 million. The Pent Gross project is split between the stormwater fund, 2.4 million, Penny fund, 300,000, water and sewer fund, 423,000 for the total of 3,159,945, but we're also getting a Swift Mud grant approved in the amount of 1,368,000 for this project. I thought I'd, since we're going in enterprise funds, I'd show the golf horse fund just briefly here. The budget is 1,395,000. It's a decrease of 26,000 from the previous year, mostly because we eliminated the administrative allocation to the general fund. It was at 62,000. Um, mostly because the, the golf course fund is sort of in the negatives and we just thought it'd be good to just get it out of the, the, the it, we've been gradually going down with the with the administrative al al allocation one year years ago we're 275,000 we then we were down to 130,000 130, and we just thought we maybe we just need to eliminate it and uh, the auditors agreed with that they said Ron why don't you just eliminate that uh, that transfer uh, the golf course of revenues are the fees for playing golf, almost 1.4 million, and the offsetting expenditures, personnel, 492,000, operating, 899,000, a little bit of capital, and the 1,395,000 of expenses. A little bit about the marina fund, budget of 207,000, $5,886 increase, 5.78%. Uh, marina fees, 107,000, and, and then the expenses are broken down by operating 63,000, I'm, I'm sorry, personnel 63,000, operating 44,000 for the 107,720. And last but not least, 
just going forward uh, <coughs> on July 23rd at the meeting will be the authorization for the city manager to sign the DR 420 forms. They set what would be the maximum millage rate for the city. It goes, once we, we sign that, it goes to the state. Uh, second budget workshop, somewhere between August 12th and 16th. I don't know if the date's been determined yet. August 12th. August 12th. It's, okay, it's August 12th, Chris, scratch out the 16th. Um, August 19th, trim notice is mailed by county, and that will have that millage rate that you determine on the 23rd. Uh, September 4th, first public hearing on tentative millage and budget. September 17th, second and final hearing on the budget and millage. October 1st, first day of the 2020 fiscal year. And that's what I got. I'm open for questions. Well, Ron, I want to uh, thank you. Uh, thank Mr. Likudas, all the staff, and all the members of the uh, Budget Advisory Committee. Uh, we have a uh, very good balanced budget without using any emergency funds and keeping the same millage as we have 5.42. Uh, also maintain to have a, um, a full a, a full service city that uh, is very important to, uh, to the people of Tarpa Springs. So I wanna thank you for all the work that you did. Uh, any commissioner comments on the, uh, pre on the uh, presentation? Vice Mayor Terrapin. Thank you. Uh, I just want to echo some of your initial comments, Mayor, and thank uh, staff and uh, the finance director and the city manager for all your hard work throughout the budget season. It's obviously not easy to budget a, or to uh, balance a $63 million budget, so uh, thank you for all your efforts on that. Um, I do have a couple uh, highlights or questions throughout the presentation, if now's the time, Mayor, to get well, into the general fund. If if it's related to the uh, to the general fund, we'll discuss it then, if you like. Okay. If it is something to deal with the uh, enterprise funds, we can talk about that then, if you want. So we're going to talk about the general fund not now? No. After we finish, just in a few minutes, okay. I'm going to ask the other budget advisory to give us their, their recommendations, All and right. then we'll come back. All right. Sounds good. Commissioner Carr. Thanks, Mayor. I uh, just want to reiterate the same from the mayor and vice mayor. I uh, know all of our department heads work uh, really hard to put these budgets together. Uh, Ron, you've put a lot of work with your team and city manager. Uh, I've bothered you enough, I think, um, probably for the next couple of years, I would imagine, with questions. <laughs> so um, as you all know, uh, I'm very passionate about this, and uh, it's important to the taxpayers and the residents. And uh, thank you all again for the, answering the questions that we have and uh, dealing with uh, some of the questions that um, you might not be used to getting, so I, I appreciate you being patient with us. So, thanks. Commission Donovan. Yeah, thank you so much, Ron. Uh, again, I really appreciate the presentation. I know how hard you work getting this all set up for us. And to the rest of the department heads, same goes to you guys. You guys do a fantastic job. Thank you. And then, of course, the Budget Advisory Committee. Thank you guys for getting this all hammered out, it's ready to go. Uh, excited to discuss tonight. Okay. Mr. LeCourge, do you have any comments? Not at this you point. Have, you're happy now, right? Well, I wouldn't go that far, but uh, <laughs> everything's good so far. Uh, now I would like to uh, invite the uh, chairman of the Budget Advisory Committee, Mr. Uh, David <clears throat> Panther, to the podium to give uh, the uh, recommendation of the Budget Advisory Committee. Thank you, Ed. Um, it feels good to be on this side of the dais for once. Um, we have we have a great committee. Uh, we have we have we have Cassie Hull here with us today, or Cassie, which one, Cassie, Cassie, and then uh, Claire McCloy, and uh, it's it's just a really great group of people. And uh, uh, as Ron said, we um, though the, though we got to meet with all the department heads. We have, we had about six six or seven meetings since the beginning of May, and uh, gone through the 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 entire budget. We have uh, so far one general, uh, you know, you know, recommendation, and then two from 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 Commissioner Carr's items. So, so the first one is to leave the millage rate as is. Um, if you review Ron's Ron's Ron, Ron's data, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, as he presented, we think with the rising expenditures and cost and the the you know uncertainty in future markets that it's best to uh, not 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 lower not not lower the millage rate you know um, at this time 
uh, and you know, at least from 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 my perspective, that was mostly from uh, his slide where he projected out all the expenditures, and I think the rest of the committee felt felt the same. And also, after reviewing where 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 we stand with it, with 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 uh, with other communities, and especially when you look at us compared to you know to you know f to 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 cities that are that are full service. Uh, then two of the items from 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 Commissioner Carr's list. Uh, I, I, the first one was the internal auditor, and we do support keeping it as is with the external firm, um, and that's purely from a financial standpoint that we're recommending that. I know there's some other politics involved there, but from our standpoint, we think financially that 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 that, that makes the best sense right now is it, to stay with that. So that's that's the one resolution that we passed. And then another one from 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 Commissioner Carr's list was the uh, salaries of commissioners. I know from personal experience that that's that that's that's a very controversial topic. But we felt with the increase in health insurance costs and with uh, surrounding communities that uh, commissioners raise uh, should go from eight thousand to ten thousand, and mayor from thirteen thousand to fourteen thousand. So I know you all have other factors to consider in in choosing that. But if you do choose to go that way. You know that that you have the support of an independent board for that, um, but overall, that's what we have right now as far as recommendations for you. Um, I appreciate Commissioner Carr for his list of items he gave us that filled up two meetings, and uh, so uh, I hope that uh, you got some of the responses that 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 that, 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 that you were looking for, and uh, I'm open to any questions. Uh, Mr. Spencer, mm -hmm. I personally want to thank you. Mm -hmm. And congratulate you. You served six years as a commissioner and the vice yeah. mayor. You didn't stop there. You continued to serve the city on the budget advisory committee as the chairman, yes, also sir. on the charter review committee. And yes, I want to thank you for your service. Thank you. I also like to thank all the members of the uh, budget advisory committee for interviewing each department head and getting all the information necessary and uh, analyzing the budget and. Uh, uh, reviewing each line item, which I, I know how uh, how difficult it is, how much work is involved, because before we had the Budget Advisory Committee, we used to do that here. So we used to spend hours and hours trying to save a couple pencils. And it really, many times, we were not even successful doing that. So I really appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, in regards to your recommendations, uh, uh, the, uh, I will start with the number two, the internal auditor, and I agree with you 100% that it financially makes more sense to do that. Also, a, uh, an auditor, uh, in nowadays, it has to have many expertise. So by having a firm that, uh, from, the, you know, from, um, from the outside, they have different uh, personnel, different people with a different expertise, they can come here. But if we have a person right here, He's not going to have all this knowledge, all the skills that he needs to have. So Correct. I agree with you. It's going to be, um, I think it's going to be the best choice, in my opinion. Uh, in regards to the uh, the millage, uh, that's, I'm going to have that a discussion here. I'm uh, sure you do that. Uh, mm -hmm. You probably already know that I'm always in favor yes. to reducing property tax mm -hmm. in any way we can. Um, as far as the, uh, the salary, and I, I mean, I can see the uh, I can see your recommendation with that, but uh, uh, gain from thirteen to fourteen thousand dollars per mayor really makes no difference to me. I really don't care. And I know that everybody here is not I, I, when you were served here. Mm -hmm. We're not here for the salary. We're here to serve. But I really don't care about the salary. Mm -hmm. okay. So I want to thank you. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Commissioner Donovan is donating his salary to to the uh, to the recreation. A different uh, different team so we're here for we're here to serve mm -hmm. and again I want to thank you Absolutely. and um, I will start with uh, Vice Mayor uh, Tara Penny if you have any <coughs> comments uh, I'll just say uh, you know thank you for your uh, service on the Budget Advisory Committee and going by uh, like the mayor said line by line and making our job a lot easier and it seems like uh, with the current board there's a lot of um, um, expertise as it relates to finance and budgeting so I trust that y'all did uh, a fantastic job and we appreciate you doing that um, I don't really have any questions or comments about your recommendations other other than just to say uh, throughout your budget process and the original budget that was presented to you um, 
did you see many changes as it relates to you know the actual budgeting and the balancing of this budget was a was a budget presented to you that you know had a lot a lot of uh things that needed to be trimmed or how did that go for you um, it was pretty holistic. I mean, it, it seemed like it was similar to the to the to the to the previous year budget, uh, just obviously with 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 with, uh, with increased expenditures. There there wasn't a whole lot um, that we had to trim back per se. There was again, be, like you said, because of the wealth of knowledge on this committee, uh, we did have some, we did have some small things, not so much trimming, but um, moving some things around, if you will. And uh, so there was a little bit of that, mostly just what I what, what I what I have, have, have brought forward, and again, very very similar to last year. Thank you, Commissioner mm -hmm. Fuller. Uh, Chairman Banther, thank you for uh, your presentation. Uh, short and sweet, always appreciated. Um, <clears throat> thank you also to uh, Mr. McCoy and Mrs. Hall for your service on the board. As well, uh, it's great having a, a fresh board on the budget advisory board to take a different look at this as well. Um, Ron and staff, thank you for working with um, the budget advisory board. I just want to go over a couple of the items that I asked the board to look at. And Mr. Banther, if you could maybe touch base on one if you have the information. If not, um, Mr. Herring, I'm sure, could cover it as well. So some of the things I asked them were um, to evaluate the increase in tax revenue over the past five years. We've seen a, a large amount of increase, but very little millage rate decrease. Uh, evaluate the other, uh, evaluate the millage rates, Tarpon Springs compared to the other Pinellas counties, um, cities. Administrative charges from the enterprise funds that are paid to the general funds, and I think we'll have some more conversations about this uh, later. Mm -hmm. But that's one I would like you to, if you have a little more information, do you recall on the conversation that you all had about that at all? Um, um, about the charges or the millage rate? Um, about the charges, I'm sorry, the administrative charges from like the stormwater and the water fund. There, there, there wasn't a whole lot on that because with this committee being new, um, obviously a, a deep, a, 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 there's a there's a deep wealth of finance knowledge, but this was more so in it, um, uh, educational for them, I think, to get them up to speed on on on, on what the enterprise funds are, what what's, what's inside of them, and, and like how they work together. So we didn't have anything specific um, recommendations or changes, just general support and what what was presented what was acceptable. Okay, and there's a handful of other items. I'm not going to read them off, but um, as a reminder too, to to uh, if it's any residents are watching this at. Obviously, the city is only part of the property taxes. You have the PSTA, you have the school board, you have the county, uh, EMS, and a couple other items as well. So we only make up a portion, or the city only makes up a portion of what actually the taxpayers pay uh, on their property taxes each year. So thanks again for your work and dedication to the city. Thank you. Commissioner Donovan. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman Banther. Um, again, I appreciate the recommendations and the extra meetings you guys put in to uh, really get this prepared. Uh, in terms of leaving the millage rate alone, um, again, I'm glad you guys look at it from strictly a financial perspective. I understand that. Um, I'm willing to discuss lowering it always, um, but that seems like a fine recommendation to me. Again, keeping the internal auditor external, uh, I w I'm also in favor of. The increase to commissioner salary, um, I disagree with. I made a campaign promise to never support that and uh, to echo what the mayor said. Uh, it's not about the money, so I will not be in support of increasing our salaries. Um, but other than that, thank you again for the presentation. Uh, you guys did a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Mr. McCoy, do you want to comment? Casey, do you want to say something? Okay. Again, I want to thank both of you, and please say thank you to the others as well, Dave. I appreciate it. Now we're going to the uh, general fund. Well, we're going to have a discussion there. I have a bunch of notes that I, I like to uh, share with everyone and also questions to Mr. Lecours and the staff. Uh, start with the uh, health insurance, which is the uh, number one benefit for the employees. We budget a 10% increase. Do we have any feeling what is that going to cost us and when we're going to find out? I'm understanding it's probably going to be closer, if I'm correct, Jane, to the beginning of August, um, somewhere around there. If you remember, usually this first budget meeting is usually towards the end of July and stuff, so we're a little closer. But I think last year we didn't quite have it yet, 
Um, it's usually been about mid-August we get that. Mid-August. So yeah. we probably won't have it on a second uh, workshop then. Might be. If you're doing August 12th, we just have to August, see and yeah. find out from them. We should be able to have it there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, uh, w what's the latest on the, uh, on the medical clinic? Any uh, new information on that, Mr. Lequeur? Not yet. Again, we're there. Some of that may be dependent on Oldsmar and what happens with Oldsmar. They're in the process now of their health evaluation, so um, that's a factor that we have to wait to see what happens with them, and then we'll see if that affects us uh, uh, with the health clinic. Okay. So, again, hopefully, and I think that one will be resolved by the 12th, so hopefully we'll have both of those. Um, we'll have both of those, a better number on the 12th. I hope we have a favorable answer. That's a very good benefit to the employees. Uh, next is the uh, marketing, which is very important to our local economy. Last year, Mr. Leclerc, we have we've done marketing in-house, and uh, our city employees did an excellent job providing that. What is your plan this year? Um, it, it's pretty much the same. I think we've got a team together. You've already seen um, what they've done so far. So I think we accomplished, if you remember, as we were talking in the last budget, it was between hiring an individual or having an in-house team. The advantage of having an in-house team is you could use the money that you would have budgeted for the marketing person to actually put in the marketing. And I think if you've seen from that team working together, um, we've got a great plan going on. So hopefully yeah. um, we can continue that for the, for the next year. Yeah, I, I don't like to put on the spot. I know Ms. Good is over here. She is the uh, person responsible for doing that. I just wonder if she has any ideas that you want to share with us, what you're going to uh, provide, additions that you already have. Well, I don't know. Do you and uh, Karen want to come up and is there anything new you two want to bring to us or, or let them know what they're going to be seeing in the immediate future that's going to be going into, that'll be going into next year? Karen Lemons, Economic Development Manager. Um, as you recall, last year, 30000 was appropriated in the budget to do a marketing campaign. So um, next Tuesday at the board meeting, we're going to be unveiling the tourism video um, that we've produced. Then we're going to have a public reception and opening on the 25th of that week for the video, and then the photo contest. And we'll be awarding the um, contest entries for the, the top categories in the photo contest. We've done seven advertorials. We have the two billboards, one at I-4 and I-75. I hope some of you have been able to see them when you're coming back from Orlando. We have the, um, uh, the on the tankful marketing that is ongoing that's um, reaching the communities that are within a tankful of Tarpon Springs, so going from uh, Crystal River, Homosassa area, all the way down to Sarasota. So that's been ongoing. I think we've had those in about eight different communities so far. We'll be continuing that. We have our website that we have up and running now. We're still working on it. It's a work in progress, but we do have it live. Um, we've been getting a, a good reaction to that. So we would like to continue all of these activities going forward um, with additional um, budgeting again. I don't think that money is in the budget right now, but with those additional funds, we'd like to do that. And then we'll be regrouping now um, in the next month or so and coming up with um, any new activities that we would like to do for the ongoing fiscal year. Diane Wood, Cultural and Civic Services. Um, I feel like um, the marketing campaign that we started this year is, um, you know, um, very balanced in the media that we're using um, from print to digital to um, newsletters, the billboards. I think we've got great exposure. I think we've got a great logo. And I'm very excited about the website because over time, we're going to be able to measure, um, you know, the analytics on that. And that will be able to, you know, give you some good information. So I'm excited about that prospect as well. But I feel like we should, we've got the motivation now to start, you know, the next phase of the campaign and the new physical year. And uh, we'll just continue to, you know, look for new opportunities to, you know, celebrate the city of Tarpon Springs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
My next question is on the hotel tax. I asked the same question last year, why we're not receiving any hotel tax. And my understanding is that uh, that can be used on events, and I'm just wondering if some of those events that we're already doing in Tarpon, like the Epiphany, First Friday, Night in the Islands, festivals, can we apply some of the money? And the other one is for capital projects. Uh, I wonder if we qualified and asked for grants for uh, a senior center in Tarpon Spring. I'm sorry, was the first question on the hotel first tax? First was on uh, <laughs> if you have, you have events. Since we're doing the Epiphany celebration, the first Friday night in the island, art festival. You're talking about having a hotel tax for that? Yeah. Well, the hotel tax doesn't come to the city. That goes to the county, and then I think you have to get with the county to try to petition them to bring the money up here. So we don't get that money directly. But we... What I'm asking is if we can actually apply for this grant or request these funds. Like yes, I, I believe you'd have to go through them. and For the events, because I believe it takes the criteria is events and capital. Is that correct, Mr. Liquid? Okay, you want to come talk about it? Because we've, <coughs> we've examined and looked at that and looked at the criteria for getting that. And I think Karen has been the one who's been looking at that. and. Yeah, that's through the Tourism Development Council, the Tourism Development Tax, through St. Pete Clearwater, CVB, and I've been going to those meetings. There's criteria for getting grants for festivals. Um, a lot of it has to do with um, stays. You have to have a certain minimum amount of people who are staying in a hotel, and you have to show that. You have to have a certain minimum number of people attending an event. Those have to be from outside of the area. So they're, they're meant to be attracting people from outside who are staying in hotels. We've looked at all of our events so far, and none of them rise to that, um, that threshold of the number of people and the, the description of staying at a hotel. You have to prove the overnight stays. Some of the events that they've had are like the Grand Prix um, at Raymond James, the, the, the festivals there. Those are festivals that are bringing in people from all over the state. We, we don't have any that are of the size and that we can prove the criteria that people are staying in our hotels to, and staying overnight. But we continue to work with them. We continue to go to the meetings. If we have an event that's large enough, we certainly will apply to, to get Epiphany some grant funds. Epiphany celebration should be large enough. Excuse me? The uh, Epiphany celebration on November 5th, that should be large enough to qualify, wouldn't you think? Well, that's a you get that, about twenty thousand people coming to Tarpon Spring. Yeah, and then there was a discussion on that because um, Mayor Credicos is on the board, and he was discussing that one in particular. There was an issue they had with that because it's um, it's a religious event, so they were actually looking at that one to see if that would be something that they could add to the criteria. And I don't believe they've made the designation on that yet. But again, we'd have to show that these that the people that are coming are staying in hotels. And we, we have to prove that. We have to do a study to show that these people that are coming are staying in hotels. The other, the other um, factor in that is admission requirements. All of, those, all of those festivals have admission requirements. None of ours are, are festivals that you have to pay to get to, except perhaps the, the chamber one, mm -hmm. the fine arts festival. But it's, it's a paid event. You have to show overnight stays at hotels. And then there's a minimum um, criteria for attendance. The other criteria is supposed to be capital. I was just wondering if building a uh, or creating a senior center that qualified for that. I'd have to look at that because the, the capital projects have been baseball stadiums and um, large museums and projects like that. So we'd have to take a look at if that would be a large enough project. Okay. Mayor? Yeah. Can I ask a question since you're on this topic? Yeah. Um, I know I, I've met with County Commissioner Eggers at one point about the dredge or the um, additional dredge that needs to be done, and he brought up something along the lines of the tourism tax. And I know there's an economic study that was completed that showed the amount of bed tax that's created from the sponge docks and the tourism industry itself in Tarpon Springs. So is it, Tarpon Springs able to leverage that use somehow in the sponge docks if it's with the stormwater projects? Um, or, I mean, we're able to show that there's a bed tax. I think we have that in the study, right? It's $400,000 a year, I believe. Um, 
has that been looked into further or uh, I just want to follow up about that. Yeah, I haven't had any conversations with him in terms of that, of the dredge project. But all those bed taxes go into, into one pot of money of the CVB and then it gets distributed. Most of it goes toward the, the running of the CVB itself. It's the, it's the salaries and, and the um, advertising and everything that they advertise the region. That's the, that's the point. And then there's certain money set aside for um, the special projects, the festivals and the smaller festivals, and then for capital projects like the stadium, they're talking now about um, the Phillies, the Dunedin project was funded through that tax. So the, the funding then gets put into all these different pieces. Um, whether we could use that, some of that money and ask for dredge as a, as a capital project, um, haven't looked at that, so we could look at that. Even other aspects of the sponge docks, too. I know flooding is a hot topic of the sponge docks or some other capital projects that, we could, that the city could look at and maybe an avenue um, where we could leverage as a city a Tarpon Springs because we could show bed tax with that economic study, and that would be a justifiable, I think, uh, aspect for that hotel tax. Yeah, certainly. I mean, we don't generate a lot of bed tax compared to other cities, but we do generate bed tax. So, you know, we we have a stake in that money just like every other community does. So we have a project that would fulfill all the requirements. We certainly need to get our fair share as well. Yeah, and with special events, you know, there will be some special events that we'll be doing, we'll be doing with this budget money. We're talking about a new event for St. Patrick's Day and possibly an equivalent of, of dying the river or the bayou or something like that. Again, those will not be ones that will meet those criteria, but again, we're still also looking at some events and stuff to add to our repertoire uh, that, you know, we'll have to have budgetary money for. So, so we will be talking about some of those in the future as far as events goes while we're on the subject of events. Yeah, we just don't want to lose any money if that's available out there. You know? yeah, absolutely. Thank you. The uh, next thing that I want to talk about is the millage. Our uh, revenue of general fund has increased by $1.3 million, or 5.24%. And of course, our expenses have been increased as well. The property values have been increased by 6.44%. I guess everybody knows that one of my goals has always have been is to reduce the millage when we can. Back in 19, 2017, we reduced the millage with my initiative from 5.45 to 5.42 uh, mills. I believe now the, uh, with the uh, increase that we have with our revenue, I am uh, proposing that we reduce the millage from 5.42 to 5.37 mills. That will show that we're trying to reduce the millage, but also maintaining uh, our emergency fund of uh, 8.8 .8 million for any emergency, for any uh, catastrophic event might happen, and still have the uh, full service city. Mr. LeCourtis, I don't expect you to have an answer now, but uh, if you please take a look at it and with uh, our finance director and come back to us on the next, uh, next meeting. And uh, I also like to uh, ask my fellow commissions to uh, yeah, I, I want to get their opinion on that. So, Vice Mayor? Mayor, you said 5.37? Yeah, from 5.42 to 5.37. So it's uh, half a mil? Is that right? Something like that, yeah. Um, is that right or not? No. No, no, it's, less than that. Point oh, so it's, no it's 0 0.05. 0 0.05. 0 .05. It would be about every 0 0.01 is an $18,000 decrease in revenue. So going to point oh, down to 5.37 would be about 90000 less in revenues to the general fund. So, so here's the rule of thumb and what you have to think about as you talk about this tonight. You need to keep that in consideration, everything you do tonight and everything you do to 12. But you need to look at the budget. You need to look at what you want in the budget. You need to look at right now there is a fund that we have in debt. We always like to leave money for the commission for their items they want to do to designate. It usually grows when some of the things come in, for instance, if health comes in at 7% instead of 10%, then that 3% would go into that pile of money. 
Right now, sitting there is $120,000 of discretionary money, the way the budget is for this board to decide. So it's going to be your decision as you look at what you want to do and what projects you're going to do, what you want to cut, how you want to use that $120,000 or whatever money's come in. Use that formula. It's $18,000 per that 0.01%. So, you know, 18 you know, just keep doing that up to what this proposed here, which is this is ninety, ninety thousand dollars. Yeah, ninety for the going down to five point three. So, so it would be so ninety thousand. When you see that, when you see what you want to do, when you see how you want to use that money, um, that whole formula comes into where that. For instance, right now, if everything stayed the same, of that hundred twenty thousand, if you if you use ninety thousand of it to reduce the millage, then there'd be thirty thousand right now for you to use or you know, cut something else in the budget and use that towards. So this has to be in your mind. Um, obviously, what we um, always do when it comes to the form is the 542 is the highest we can go. Uh, and that's what's going to be proposed when that comes forward. That's going to be proposed. But we can always reduce you can go price. lower. You cannot go higher than that. And we know right now from this board, I can tell you this board's not going higher. So that's a good thing. But, but we'll say that because once we set that, and it'll be set before you decide these things in the budget, you can't go up. So this would be a decision you have to keep in your mind all throughout the process. And when we get through the 12th and all the things the commission wants in there to add and subtract, um, the amount of money times at 18,000 per, per 0.01%, um, that would be your ability to, to cut it and keep the budget the same. So, so again, it's, it, it's moving on what, what you want to do and what additions and traction you make in there um, to well, do. It can also, let me give the mayor some feedback if that's all right with you, Mayor. Yes, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing I'll say is there's not, we can we can uh, reduce the millage not with, just with the $120,000 pot of money that you're talking about. It can We can reduce it and balance the budget from other places right. too, in theory. Yeah. So, and then the other thing I'll say too is if that, you know, we get in a position where we need to get some more money, we can always do a budget resolution, right, in terms of discretionary money. Like we set the millage rate, the bu budget's balanced halfway through the year. We need some more money for something. Yes, you go into reserves and get the money. Yeah, okay. that's where you go into so reserves I mean, and get the money. If it was necessary, I'm just yes. saying. Yeah. So, you know, in, in terms of giving the mayor some feedback on what he's potentially proposing or, or you know, reducing the millage rate to 5.37, I'll say that, you know, generally speaking, I would always support a reduction in the millage rate given that it's an appropriate time to do so or we're not putting ourselves in jeopardy in one way or the other. Um, you know, I do think and I've always been a proponent of generally doing it. I think I was on the board when we reduced oh, yeah. it in 2017 um, and supported uh, that initiative then. So the biggest thing for me as it relates to the millage and staying competitive with the surrounding communities is, is that in itself. It's just for a full service community staying competitive regarding our millage rate and our expenses and taxes and things like that. I'll say that if you are going to reduce the millage rate, I find it more productive to do so in fat years versus in lean years, right? In lean years, you're generally looking to like, where are we going to get the money to balance the budget versus in a fat year where, you know, essentially our property taxable value increases have almost balanced the budget with exception to a few big expenses and some enterprise funds. So, I mean, if we're going to reduce the millage rate, it's a good year to do it. So, if that gives you any feedback. Thank you. Commissioner Clark. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I know we've had this conversation in the past couple of years. Uh, I first want to come back to the um, Budget Advisory Board. I know one of the recommendations was not to um, raise it. Was it not to decrease it also? I can't remember. Did I keep it the same? Okay. Um, with that, I, I respect that opinion from all the board members, but I would be in favor to decreasing it in this situation, and here's a few reasons why. Um, it's projected over, um, I know 1.5 was brought up, but my math came out to 1.8. Um, over the past three years that we've seen an increase in the ad valorem tax increase. Uh, then if I go back to 2014, we're looking at a $2.7 million increase uh, to the ad valorem taxes that we're bringing in at the city revenue-wise. So I would completely be in favor. I think it's time to, to, um, to show the citizens that the city is looking to do a tax decrease. We've seen increases on water rates. Um, we've seen some other increases around. Um, the millage was increased when the economy was going down. We had to increase, or uh, the commission at the time had to increase the millage to supplement the taxes to increase the revenue. And I think right now, with the tax taxable values as high as they are, um, it's it's worth it's worth it if we need to give up a, a 
small project here or there or rebalance some areas to the taxpayers or the citizens. Um, one of the other areas, Mayor, that I want to talk about also would be the administrative fees that are coming out of the water and stormwater and sanitation funds. Yeah, um, we'll we'll, we'll talk about that later, and I think it ties into all this as well. Yeah. Um, but that's something I would be in support. This is enterprise fund you're talking about. Yes. So uh, I would be in support of a tax decrease right now. Thank you. Mr. Dunn. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, anytime we can reduce the millage, uh, I'm all for it. Again, as long as it's fiscally responsible. Uh, I'm not too concerned with the $120,000 uh, kind of artificial cap that, that that's there because, again, in theory, I mean, we can get flexible from other places. Um, but, again, I mean, I, I want to hear more from the Budget Advisory Committee and, and see some more statistics on all the possible outcomes. Uh, but overall, I would support it right now. I think this is one of the easiest ways we can make our citizens' lives easier. And this is one of the most direct ways that um, our decisions affect them. So I would absolutely uh, support the lowered millage rate. Yeah. Thank you. Again, I'd like to ask Mr. Lecours and Mr. Herrick that if you take a look at it and come back with the information with that. And if you please work with the Budget Advisory Committee as well. And again, I appreciate your input and uh, your recommendations, but I think this year is a better year to, to reduce the millage with the increase of uh, the revenue that we have. Thank you. Um, next item that I want to uh, talk about is FEMA. We received $313,000 for FEMA. Are we expecting any reimbursement to come to us? I'm sorry, are we expecting any more? Is any more? Any reimbursements to come to it? Well, the main, we got the main uh, from the EOCP employees that work there. We got the, a little over 300,000. We are still waiting on about 1.2 million of the debris removal what was charged to the sanitation fund. So we're going on almost two years, and we're not alone in this. I don't know if some of it's political that as far as getting the money, but uh, all our paperwork is with with the FEMA. The state has auditors, Grant Thornton, that are go, digging through this. They just had us some questions last week, and they're just trying to verify some load tickets when they went to pick it up. So we have 1.2 million we're waiting to get back. Of the 1.3 million of charges, we're saying we're thinking we'll probably get about 1.2 million of that back. Okay. Do you know if the uh, funds have already been transferred to state to the state or still under FEMA? I'm sorry. Are they, so if the funds have already been transferred to the state level or? They're no, they're the still with the federal government. The state goes through it, and they're trying to validate the expenditures right now. They're looking at all the load tickets, and once they approve that, then the, the federal government would release some money. Yeah. Well, when I was in the uh, conference uh, in, in uh, Orlando, I met the guy in charge of FEMA, and he promised me if I have any uh, concerns to give him a call. So if you give me the information, I call him. Maybe you'll be some help to it. I will get that right away. <laughs> well, doesn't hurt to try, doesn't it? May I have a question about that? Of course. Where did, assuming we get the one point two million, where does it go? It goes back into the sanitation fund where we've budgeted or reserved for that, and that's part of my concern is that we had like little over three million in there. We spent 1.3 million, so we're down to about two million dollar reserve in there. And my concern is, if it takes FEMA so long, what happens if we have another hurricane? What happens if we have two in a year? You know, if that happens, maybe we're having to go into the general fund to cover debris removal. So it'd be nice if FEMA was a little faster on this, but. Get him pay up, <laughs> yeah. Get him pay up, Mayor. Give him a call. <laughs> well, you, you promised me that, so I won't. I won't let him forget it. Uh, I know that uh, the next uh, uh, workshop uh, workstation is going to be on August 12th. We're going to be talking about wages. But Mr. Lecourt, is there any way they can provide us some data? Uh, if you can compare the wages of our management team compared to the other cities and see how we're doing. What What's your meaning of management team? Well. Yeah, that'll be, I guess, from supervisor the all the way up to the you. Yeah. No, from a supervisor all the way up to you. Okay. Thank you, sir.
Mr. Lecourt, do we have any general fund project schedule for to be done next year? I know our public works department did a lot of projects this year, and uh, we are very fortunate we got many talented people. Do you have a lot of uh, projects yeah, scheduled for and, that? Yeah, and we'll be talking can about you, those next meeting. Yeah, can you share that with us as well? Yeah. Yeah, I know that uh, <laughs> our friend there is waiting for it. Thank you. But anyway, they're doing an excellent job. Please let them know. Uh, some of the projects that I am, uh, you know, uh, I want to see to be done in the city in the uh, short term or long term is uh, the fire station on the Gulf Road, the senior center, parking garage, board ramp with parking, and to rebuild the tennis courts on Riverside Drive. So. This is what I have, and I want to turn it over to uh, Vice Mayor Terrapin. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just have some relatively general questions, observations. Some of it's uh, been covered, and I made some notes in uh, Ron's presentation, so I'll, I'll start there. Uh, page six, Ron, of your presentation, the pamphlet. Um, I just wanted to point out, and some of this is rhetorical. Some of it's for uh, members of the public who are tuning in online. Um, <clears throat> but if you look at the, on page 10, or sorry, page six of your handout, and it says total city budget, and it looks, you know, perceivably that there's a 10% increase, which there is, but I think that it's important. Initially, when you look at that, your kind of eyeballs pop out of your head a little bit, and 10% increase to the city's budget in a given year is pretty substantial. But I think it's important to recognize and go down, you know, the line a little bit in the, in the fact in the water and sewer fund you know, attributes for 12%, and then the stormwater, there's that 136%. So I think if you were to more or less take those out there, and of these five uh, funds acu accumulate 90% of the city's uh, budget, it basically equates to somewhere around a 5% change. Is that right? Correct. If you take out those capital items and those funds, correct. Right, which is a lot more palatable than a 10% increase. 10%. Um, and in part, I wanted to touch on some of the uh, something that the mayor just left on is regarding our personnel costs, which make up you know a percentage of this increase. Part of the reason I feel like why we have uh, an, an increase in, or a rise in personnel costs is as it relates to as much as we're trying to do. I mean, we're trying to run full bore with projects and inspectors, and the, the town is growing you know at a strong pace right now. So, to me, it's important to highlight that some of that personnel cost is just out of pure necessity and hiring new people and creating new positions versus just, you know, salary increases. So I think that's important to note. Um, in the general fund on that line, uh, you have salary and benefits and then R&M. I was hoping that you could elaborate on R&M. Just tell us what that meaning is. Well, repairs and maintenance. Uh, to me, we're, we're seeing a lot more in repairs and maintenance. And what I've seen over the last, I think, four years, you know, where we used to be like 600000 a year, we're getting up close to a million a year in repairs and maintenance. What I've seen is a lot of it, it's software and I think communication these days and the maintenance required for it. You know, everybody wants transparency, uh, so there's a lot of IT maintenance. Uh, I know I mentioned the, the Microsoft uh, uh, MDM 360, 365, whatever it is. I'm not sure what it is, but that's something that's required for the IT. The firewalls that are being required, the security that's being required. It's also it's also repairs and maintenance on communication in the police department and all the softwares they've got. Mm -hmm. So a lot, I'm just seeing a lot more maintenance between IT, police, and fire departments where it's increased over the last four years. So in the on page nine, and I want I'm flipping ahead a, a few pages, but on page nine, you have that uh, operating expenditures increase around a little about five hundred sixty thousand. That's within that, uh, let's see, that's within that million three increase between fiscal year 2019 and 2020? Well, this, that is the total city. That's all part of the total city. That's not just the general fund. Oh, that's right, 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 okay. But the IT cost there is 70,000. Yes, and that is mostly the general, general fund there. Okay, um, let's see here. And then on page seven, uh, so the unassigned fund balance right now is 8.8 .8 million, is that right? Yes. And then again, for the public, as a percentage of our general fund budget, we need to keep how much in reserve? We have the fund balance policy as 20% 20, 20 of the general fund. Of the general fund expenditures, right. yes. So 
the property insurance on page seven is a 10% increase, and you're estimating that, correct? Correct. Now, property insurance, you can elaborate. That's this building, that's all of our- It's all the buildings. It's a property liability insurance on, and the auto insurance too. Mm -hmm. And have we looked at possibly a, a way to uh, reduce that, get credits as it relates to new roof, new windows? Uh, Commissioner Donovan can probably elaborate on this. I mean, you know, you put a brand new roof on the library, in theory, the library insurance should maybe be reduced, right? I would imagine so. I think that'd be a question uh, once we do that and getting with the Florida League of Cities okay. who handles our insurance policy. Right. The increase in uh, insurance to me is to be expected from a health and dental you know, standpoint. Um, the property insurance to me, you know, I think is competitive enough to where we can try and reduce that. I mean, obviously with older buildings, insurance is expensive and we have mm -hmm. a lot of older buildings. Um, but I'd like to I'd like to look at the property insurance and, and try and see if we can't fine tune that in such a way to where we can reduce it or at least look to reduce it and uh, be actively talking to uh, the municipal insurance trust to try and figure out a way or, or propose to them like, look, in this building we did this, in this building we did that, and try and bring that number down some. Uh, I had on page eight, I just wanted to point out that the property taxable values, that increase of 6.4%. Um, to me, if you look at the, uh, going back to the increase in the budget with exception to the capital projects, if it's right around a 5% increase, like I said before, the, the increase in property tax values has in theory kind of balanced our budget. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, so, and then on page nine, uh, the CRA plan update, is that is that expense coming out of the CRA or is that a general fund expense? CRA. Okay, so that's something to me that I would not support. I think that the plan uh, needs to be updated in aspect, um, but I'd rather see that if assuming the seventy five thousand dollars would come out of the CRA account, I would rather see that money go towards more bricks and mortar type things. Um, you know, more money in the facade grant programs or other grant programs that I feel like have really uh, benefited the CRA in general. Um, if we wanted to put that, that $75,000 or, or that expenditure in a different category, if the general fund wanted to pick that up, then I would move forward with it. But, you know, there are parts of the CRA that need the plan that needs to be updated. There's, you know, no doubt about that. But for me, the 75 grand, I feel like is more beneficial uh, through bricks and mortar or project, you know, tree plantings, I mean, new light poles, things of that nature versus uh, updating the plan as a whole, I feel like we could potentially continue to, uh, you know, on a, so to speak, on a case by case basis, update the plan, you know, versus just spending 75 grand to do it at once. I think that that money is better, you know, more beneficial to items that I suggested. In the 12th, we'll, br we'll bring the layout of where we got the figure from, what all it gets you, where you can decide, well, we want this portion, not this portion. So all that would be laid out in the different layers that you can do and what we got from other cities have you look at all those things and then you make a decide then, but that, that will be bringing you to 12th to look at it. And on the 12th, when you're doing that in terms of per adding perspective to, you know, how far our CRA monies are going, you know, we'll have the, hopefully we'll have the statistics, which generally you do on the grant, how many have been had, you know, where the grant funds at now, how much money's in the CRA. So it's, you get a full perspective on our, on our CRA in general. Right. Um, just, but, just to clarify, I'm sorry. I, I think we are getting a. And maybe you mentioned that we are getting a grant for twenty five thousand for this for the plan update. Just for us. That's just for. Is that, that's not for that West one. Okay. Avenue. That's that's nothing. Yeah. Um, yeah, but we'll have, we'll have all the whole thing that you talked about. We'll have that for the for you on the. 12th. I mean, and if there's another option for you know, to uh, to to pay for it through a different fund or a different account, then I would be more willing to do so. I just don't want the CRA to pay for it. Um, the electric costs at the water plant, uh, as a percentage in terms of the revenue that's generated from that as an expense, if you if you could say as a percentage, what do you think that is? Paul, you want to come? Paul has done, done uh, looked at that and had the perspective on that. Paul, can you come up and talk about that? Paul Smith, Public Services Director. I want to make sure I understand the question. Um, 
Well, I'm looking at the electric cost at the water plant, right? Yeah. That's about 100 grand. So as an expense in relation to revenue, the water plant in terms of water uh, sales generates, and I know that uh, Ron had that in the in this presentation. I just don't know where to go back and find it right now. But how much uh, revenue does the water plant generate? And then I'm looking at the electric cost just as an expense. Yeah, if I could put it in perspective, um, we're looking at somewhere around operating $1.6 million for the reverse osmosis facility. And then if you add the personnel in, it's another 1.1. So you're somewhere around $2.7 million in operating costs. So that's where that 100000 would fit in. That would be somewhere around, oh, I need a little help with that math. But um, Oh, that's the increase. Right? One, about yeah, 3%, yeah. I think, somewhere in that. Explain the increase. Explain that was one of the questions. That I sent to the commission. Car. Explain, explain what that is. Explain how the solar project uh, <clears throat> yeah. uh, hopefully will contribute and bring that down. Sure. There's uh, several things at play there uh, that make the electric bills go up. The first obvious one is to Duke Energy increase their rates. We went back and looked at, uh, and I will tell you, these rate schedules are very complex. There's lots of combinations of on-peak, off-peak, fixed charges. So we looked at the same month for going back three years. And we measured the difference between 2017 and 2019, and we came up with almost a 24% difference in the rate for this particular setup of the RO facility and all the wells. So that's a significant impact on us. We're doing some other things, though, to reduce those costs. We've got a solar project going on now that you all have supported. We estimated at that time that's about a 50000 per year reduction in electrical costs. So that's going to help us moving forward. We're also doing some things operationally. Um, we're adding some new wells that will affect the uh, overall salinity of the water. With the RO facility, the saltier the water coming in, the more pressure it takes to treat it, the more energy it takes. So that's going to help bring that down. And then finally, we developed in-house um, our own way to clean the membranes. Just like any kind of filter, these membranes build up over time and it makes back pressure. So when we can do a special cleaning, we did a lot of research on this, had a company come in and work with us on it, we are able to reduce that back pressure. That's something we can only do maybe every two or three years, but it's something that's going to help us keep those costs down. In the solar project, when do you expect that to be online? Because that basically takes half of that increase in itself. Yeah, uh, the original estimate was uh, four months. We're going to be getting started in September uh, for construction, so we should be online I'd say within six months or so cool um, and uh, Ron covered the IT maintenance costs in a nutshell um, on page 13 um, under operating expense you have health insurance consultant I was hoping that you could uh, touch on the on who that consultant is or what we're utilizing them for? Well, right now we're, we're, we're going out to bid. So we're going out to bid for those services. Oh, that's the, that's that, the, yeah, gotcha, what, what gotcha. the board decided yeah, on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So that's in, that's in the process and we're, we're getting into the, the, the beginning of the bid process now to, to bring whichever firm we choose on board. Got it. Uh, page 15. You have charges for service uh, in the county funding fire, county funding EMS, and um, this is a charge. This is our charge to the county. Is that correct? Yes, that's a, the fire is a county with money we get from the county. Uh, right. The fire portion is the portion they pay for us for taking care of the area outside the city and yeah, the unincorporated area. area. So my question is that twenty grand seems a little light. How is that negotiated? Well, that's the, that's the increase. Uh, it. It's okay, that's the increase again. The okay, total sorry. is three hundred eighty thousand is what we're what we've budgeted. Sounds a lot better, Ron. <laughs> uh, that's all I got for the general fund. Thank you. Thank you, Commission Caller. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, thanks for your comments and taking half my comments out. Appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> But a couple of items I just want to um, touch base on. I've got some items that's going to be uh, falling under the enterprise, obviously. So I may overlap a couple of them, but I'll try to do my best. Um, so I want to start off with the marketing fund. Uh, I'm happy to support that. I believe it's 
um, it's thirty five thousand or thirty thousand that's in there. Uh, there is a line on page one forty three and it's line forty eight and it talks about I think it's uh, twenty thousand dollars. I was just curious um, what that actually entails. If someone could let me know about that. Uh, one forty-eight. Oh, that's not right. Well, I don't know if Diane knows or if the Ron knows. It's a twenty thousand um, dollar. It's under the marketing um, section. One forty-eight. That's not one forty-eight. After I look at it, actually. So. You know, we've got a hundred. Th I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. We got thirty-five thousand on 143, page one forty-three. Yeah, one forty-three. So above that, there's a twenty thousand um, dollar. Yeah, that's tourism part. local promotion. What what does that entail? I was just curious. Is that something that we, as a city, does on top of the marketing funds with the local um, department? Yeah, I don't know if that's part of it, but I'll let them answer that. <laughs> I got a good idea, though. <laughs> that's the ongoing things that we've been doing, um, the advertising in the Tampa Bay Times, those inserts that go in in the, in the Sunday newspapers. Um, that's the things that we've been doing all along. Okay, so that's 20000 for that, and then there are also additional, well, then there's brochure distribution of 13000 and then a total of 35,000 for additional, right? So we're looking at uh, 55, 65, 68,000 uh, or so in advertising dollars. Am I right in saying that? Right, because some of that, the, the 20 also includes, we've got um, billboards at St. Pete Clearwater Airport inside the baggage claim carousels. Um, we have a lot of advertising that we split with the Merchants Association. And then those brochures, those are our city uh, main tourism brochures that we print a couple hundred thousand um, every year. Those go to the, all the AAA centers, all of the um, locations, the tourist locations all throughout the state. And that's something that we've got ongoing. Everywhere you see those kiosks and all the brochures when you go to gas stations and other you know tourist places, you'll see our brochures there. Got it. Uh, so I'm in, I'm complete support of this uh, continuing. And also, I support this uh, using the funds over hiring an additional position when we have a combination of the economic developer, uh, the research and information uh, staff member, and also the arts marketing team member as well. So I think it's prudent uh, that the city continues to fund this instead of hiring a new position. Uh, and also, the tourism is lifeblood and has such a large impact indirectly, indirectly to our economy here in Tarpon Springs. So I, I do feel that it's important that we continue to do this. Uh, just on the same line, uh, there's a there's a grant. I'm sorry, there's a grant and aid. Uh, I just want to point out to the Pinellas Safe Harbor. I believe that's um, a foundation that helps abuse of women that have been abused. That's the correct? that's the homeless. And the homeless one. That, okay. That's where we bring where our officer, our community homeless officer, brings the brings them in Largo to. Okay, so I'm happy to support that one as well. Uh, a few items I just want to bring up um, just for discussion, maybe for the next uh, time around, is uh, I, I believe there's an area that we can use some help on in code enforcement uh, for um, just an additional person that could go around and help with uh, the officer that currently does this as a whole. Uh, it's obviously an important part. I hear a lot of this uh, throughout the, the city from the city residents, that they feel that there's some areas that definitely need to be improved upon. Uh, so I would support also some additional help there. Um, and again, this is an area that we wouldn't have to necessarily fund out of general funds. It could be out of the fines that have, um, I, I'm not saying there should be a quote or anything along those lines, but there's obviously fines that are collected through the code enforcement. And this position can be funded uh, specifically through those fines collected. And I think as a commission, we should look at how these code enforcement funds are, um, how they're allocated once they're received instead of going directly into the general funds. Um, look at beautification, look at um, other aspects, and I would like to have that as agenda item as well in the future um, to discuss as well. Absolutely. So as it relates to the additional help for code enforcement, um, one, I guess when the time comes, maybe you can further elaborate on what you envision for that position because it seems like the 
current code enforcement officer is doing a lot more now than has been done in yeah. the past. Uh, good and you know, good and bad. I mean, some people don't like it because they're getting fined, and some people like it because we're beautifying, you know, helping clean up the city. But at when you bring that forward, if you can elaborate on what you think that position should entail, and then also, I think you're on to something with trying to uh, uh, better allocate those fines that are collected and put them to use. Uh, and I would just say that I think you should put that on an agenda sooner than later to discuss it as it relates to budget season. Agreed. City Manager. Also, if you want to add to that, uh, the court enforcement officer now is part of the police department. Right. So what, you know, you think the next, you know, the other person will be, his help will be uh, part of the police department or in the civilian position? Or is it? Admin help. Well, uh, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, something. And I'll connect with the police chief about that too. That's something that we can talk about, obviously. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so one other thing I saw that I, when I was looking at the budget, I didn't see any maintenance uh, budgeted for the Safford House. I know it's a wooden structure. Um, the porch, I think, was in pretty rough shape at one point. Uh, is there a need? I'm not sure who would be responsible for that. Um, but I think it'd be prudent to look at or allocate some money. I think each Ron's year. looking to try to find the maintenance now. Under the Safford, I didn't really see anything under the Safford house uh, really budgeted for much. But I think it's important that there's something that needs to be done there just because I know what the uh, the old city hall and downtown, what's it called? The yeah, Center? what they usually have within that department there. What was that, Ron? I'm sorry. So within within that department, they usually budget the maintenance for the Safford House. Tom's looking too to see if there's anything in in his budget. Because sometimes it'll be in his budget. For okay. Him. So I think he's looking. As we're talking, he's okay. He's looking right now. I just want to bring that up because I so think we, bring that we need to put some eyes on it. Um, okay. And now that we don't have a staff member there full time, that it, it I just don't want that to be neglected in any way because obviously wood rot is a, a detriment to our buildings here in in Florida. Okay, we'll be looking for that and get back to you. Um, cemetery, that's an enterprise fund, right? Mm -hmm. okay. the, the cemetery? Yes. It's not an enterprise. It's part of the general fund. Okay. Let's talk about it then. Um, there's been some articles over the past few years about Rose Cemetery, and I know Rose Cemetery is not a uh, city-owned cemetery, but obviously it has a lot of um, residents, and it has a lot of history. It was a cemetery that was on the historic registry before um, the city-owned cemetery. Um, there's it, it's a community and a culture that have a, a lot of families that are in a demographic of Tarpon Springs that um, may have not been honored in the way they should have been honored in the past. And I think it would be prudent and would be a, a great thing to see the city partner um, with the people that that run that um, cemetery. And if it's looking at using the interest that's earned on the perpetual fund, if it's two to five thousand dollars for a few years to help with uh, beautification of the front, or if it's if we are allocating some staff help to help mow some of the areas, I'm not really sure how that could work. Um, but I think it would be, um, I think it's, I think it's deserved to show respect um, to all the past city residents that are buried there um, to really partner with the Rose Cemetery as uh, the city of Tarpon Springs. So I'd like to make that recommendation. Um, to somehow work with them. I'm not. I mean, those are a couple ideas. Maybe there's some other ideas that we could come up with as a as a city. Coming back to uh, or staying on the interest rates, uh, Ron, if you could, is what is the um, the reserves typically um, produce on the interest rates? I know they range from like two to like two point five percent in CDs and rotating CDs? Well, the interest rates, we were going up until about the middle, towards the middle of December. Rates were going up nicely, CDs, federal instruments, and then all of a sudden you had uh, tariffs, trade talks, government shutdown. So where we used to be able to get interest a uh, 3% a little above, right now we're right a little bit above 2%. I, we just bought something for 2.15 a, a CD just last week. Okay. So we've seen them come down about, you know, 1%. So the interest that we earn off that, does that just go right back in the general fund, or where does that actually go? 
Well, it depends on what, where the event. We got them across funds. If it's a general fund, most of it's general fund, um, water and sewer fund, sanitation. They're the ones that have the majority of the money, stormwater fund. Um, we've got a money market. Um, they're, they've still kept it at 2.05%, so a lot of the other funds, that money's in there. Okay. Uh I, I do want to make a recommendation that we look, or the, the board also look at um, how we allocate as a board the interest that's earned off the reserve or unallocated funds instead of just going right back into the unallocated and how we could potentially look at using that additional interest on additional sidewalks and additional road resurfacing and tarpon springs. Uh, these are areas obviously that we could improve upon and there's always complaints coming in through about quality of roads and sidewalks, et cetera, um, and how that could be allocated. Currently today, though, the allocation for the annual budget, I believe, is off a perpetual fund. That's a $2 million that's per charter that we need to have um, as a city, and I'm correct by that. One of my recommendations is actually to go ahead and get rid of that uh, and then use that money for a current project and allocate the $2 million, at least in the unassigned funds, to fulfill that um, that, that hole or that need. And then also we could look at additional interest that's earned as well for additional sidewalk repair or street repairs. Uh, and then the second or the second recommendation out of that would maybe look at looking re to restore some of the roads that used to be brick um, or focusing on the brick roads that need to be restored uh, still around Tarpon Springs. Obviously that uh, brings in a lot of character, a lot of, um, a lot of history uh, to Tarpon Springs or the brick road. So um, anyway, we could look at using brick additionally around the town and the roads would, I think, be beneficial to the city. Um, one, a couple other items I would like to bring up is the solar panels. I know this would be a capital expense, but this is actually falling into the general fund for uh, our electric costs. Uh, I would be in support of pulling out some type of debt um, to um, add solar panels to City Hall, the community center, public safety building, um, ultimately the areas that produce or that pull a lot of electricity. I believe City Hall is around $50,000 a year um, in electricity uh, that the city pays from Duke Energy. So uh, I know there's also a lot of solar panel companies that work with, that have engineers that could come up with a plan where you could have some type of low um, interest bearing loan against the solar panels. The solar panels pay off the loan and also help cover a significant amount of electricity over a certain amount of years. Uh, this just seems like a no-brainer to me. Uh, and it should be something I think we look at for all the city buildings, especially since the cost of solar has gone down significantly. And then at that point, it gives us, as a city, more money to use in other funds instead of paying Duke Energy the electricity bills. Commissioner, let me interrupt you for a second. Uh, on the solar energy, uh, USF is willing to work with us, uh, USF Engineering Department. Is willing to work with us to do any design that we want for free. Great. So, uh, Dr. Ferrakidis is waiting for a phone call. Okay. Yeah. And I think he's working with Paul right now on a project to uh, write to the ROI plan. It's great news. Good stuff. Um, this one is going to fall into next meeting, but I just want to bring it up. Uh, executive assistant, we have a handful around uh, City of Tarpon Springs. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, I think there's a pretty large disparity between the wages of the executive assistant. So Can somehow we talk about the wages during the next meeting. Or? Yeah, I'm going to bring it up now because I don't want to wait uh, for. It. I just I think I want to have more information in the next meeting. Okay. I'm just bringing it up because I think it needs to be brought up because there's just a large disparity between between these. So if you could bring it for the next meeting, um, some additional information to where we could make this level set. Um, and again, uh, Chairman Bantha brought up something along the lines of the mayor and commissioner pay. That was brought up, I think, uh, what their recommendation was is if you have a family that's on the health insurance that you wouldn't have to pay as a commissioner the city money to cover your health insurance costs. So I think that was a justification behind making the raise to the city commissioners. Uh, and then secondly, I would like to ask that um, this commission, I think, should be equipped with tablets 
instead of getting binders every week for the meetings, that we should have some type of tablet uh, that we could work off of. Um, I really like my phone, but it's difficult to get all my emails off that and just work off my phone for all the projects. So uh, I would encourage that the city look at another aspect. I think it's a green initiative or a sustainable initiative as well, is to stop printing all the paper that we print. It could help save on the paper cost uh, that we look at using tablets uh, for the commissioners. Pretty common, just so, I mean, as across other cities, yeah. yeah, pretty common. Um, overtime pay would that fall under a salaries area? I mean, that's what would you call that, Mark? Unless you need more information to, you know, to give yeah. on that. It probably, it probably, it, it probably almost fall both. I'm fine with waiting until next meeting for it. I mean, there's just a significant amount of overtime. More information is good to bring it up so they have a. Okay, part. yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be wise, and I've talked to the police chief about this, but. Um, currently, and it's been over the past handful of years that the combined the police and fire have been spending around a million dollars in overtime amongst the two uh, organizations within the city. So I would like uh, the police chief to share a little bit about um, the needs and explain a little bit of why they're budgeting 475000 uh for overtime this year. And it's been that way for some a handful of years now. So if you could sure. touch on that a few, for a few minutes. Is it just for next meeting then? Huh? That's okay. good. I mean, yeah. okay. that way we have that information. Okay. We're all yeah. And so I know we've the city as a whole too. It, it's about two seventy five for the fire. So I know we've gone past that as a city in the four hundred thousand dollar range. So if we could touch on that as well from the fire standpoint. Um, Again, I know the uh, CRA is about, uh, I want to echo some of the comments that Commissioner Terrapani talked about and what the CRA is developed for and what it's actually intended for. Uh, currently, the CRA funds 1.8 FTEs out of the revenues for the CRA each year. Um, I feel that this should be funded out of the general funds unless these individuals or these FTEs are being utilized within the CRA itself. Uh, and the goal of the CRA is beautification and removal um, and removing blighted properties. Uh, so unless we're using these staff members for that, I don't really feel that it's fair that we're taking the funds that should be used for those types of items um, out of the CRA. So I would encourage that those would also come out of the. Um, and we can get either now or then. We got the figures. Those are actual hours that we use. If you want to do it now or you want to do it with a salary, with. Well, we don't really have the data. Let's wait. Let's do okay. it first. You know. Okay. And then if we could touch a little bit on the LED lights for the, um, I believe it's slide 13. It talks about electric street lights, LED maintenance, and 70 new lights. Uh, is there any common sense has said the LED lights use less electricity? You would think they'd be cheaper to run. So if someone could touch on that a little bit yeah, well, on this for me. Good evening. Good evening, Tom Punch, Public Works Director. Yeah, actually, you're right. They actually are cheaper to run. They're more expensive, actually, on the initial installation. Okay. And the maintenance costs are a little bit higher. So it kind of washes itself out. If you're talking about the Duke Energy lights going in, uh, it's a small percentage. It's not very much. And what they're doing is as these new lights come in, we're, we're actually collecting the, well, they're actually collecting the maintenance costs now. And over time, as the usage drops down, it should again level off. And, and, and it'd be much better at that, that point. You wouldn't see large increases like we have. How right long now. these lights last for, Tom, typically, uh, compared to the traditional lights? Traditional lights? They're saying 15 to 20 years. And a traditional light lasts around one to, three to uh, five? They so? can, seven to 10 years on, on okay. average. So, yeah. yeah, that's a big difference, right? Yeah. And they got a lot of the money where you see the increase was those additional lights. Yeah, uh, you know, explain what you look with. Yeah, the, there's additional lights on US 19. We actually have. Uh, 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 we actually get funds back from FDOT, but they added additional 70 lights from the Tarpon Avenue up to the uh, Pasco County line last year. Uh, this year we'll get additional revenue to cover those additional costs, about $20,000. Uh, there's also been additional lights put in the city, too, around the city. I've had a large increase. Uh, we've been talking about uh, MLK and Safford Avenue got new lights in. We have to absorb the cost about putting lights up on poles that didn't have lights before. Uh, Bayshore had lights put on uh, Florida Avenue and uh, Golf Road by the school. We had a number of lights put up. So some of those those jumps just bump up a little bit for the initial uh, installation of those lights, but then they should come down over time uh, without adding more lights. Okay, that's great to hear. Okay. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let's see, the majority of the other items are enterprise fund questions I have, but I do want to reiterate, uh, I thought Vice Mayor Terry Franny had a great comment about the insurances. Uh, that's something that I shop often myself uh, for property insurance and flood insurance and also auto insurance. So I know that uh, typically with the insurance companies, they'll give you a great rate to come in. And then after the handful of years, they'll do a steady increase. And then you look back and you're paying significantly more. So you have to go back and then shop it again. And then we'll get a good grade again. And then they'll increase again. So we just have to keep an eye out on that. So I support going out to bid for that as well. And to reiterate, uh, I think it's important that we uh, definitely do the health insurance this year like it's been asked the past two years. That's all my questions right now. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Commission Dunn. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, real quick before I uh, kind of take the ball here, I just uh, wanted to suggest uh, to Commissioner Carr, uh, I saw an uh, email chain to the BOC the other day. I thought it was a great idea about a, a grant or a match, match program involving murals on the side of businesses. Is that something that you might consider uh, for the code enforcement additional position or for code enforcement funds, uh, kind of expounding on that? From a pub public art standpoint? Yeah. Yeah, I've got some ideas um, that I have written down that I proposed actually to the Charter Committee, and they suggested that we probably look at it from a commission standpoint. Okay. Um, public art would be a, a great example of how we could use some additional funds because when you think of a code enforcement, they're going after blighted properties typically. And the goal of code enforcement is get them within compliance of what the code says. So if you have a blighted property, you're able to collect funds from it via fines or whatever it may be. I think it would be advantageous or it makes sense for the city to go ahead and put it back into beautification somehow. How do you do that? It's taking care of your own property, beautification projects, public art, and then obviously taking care of our seniors is one of the most important things too. So it's a combination between multiple items. So I think I'll just add that to the list. Yeah, definitely. I just thought it was a great idea. I Thank to, you. Uh, get that. Uh, before I get the ball rolling on my questions, too, um, I felt a little guilty when I was going through the budget because I was suggesting slashing certain things, and I didn't have really any excuse or any solution as to how to get that money back. So I had some productive discussions with a few department heads um, on how possibly we could generate more revenue for our general fund or, or some additional funds. Um, and kind of where I landed was our building permitting process um, hasn't been touched in some time now. Uh, so if Director Powell uh, could come up here and uh, just have a couple questions for you. Good evening, Kevin Powell, Building Development Director. Yeah, thank you very much for letting me annoy you as much as I do with my phone calls. Um, thanks for taking my questions and working with me on this. I really appreciate it. Uh, so it's my understanding right now that in, as far as our building permitting process goes, uh, it's, it might be a little bit overcomplicated um, and it hasn't been touched in some time. When's the last time we worked on our, our restructured, our building permitting It process? was uh, 2003 is when the last time they looked at the uh, fees for the building department. And it's uh, quite lengthy. Um, you know, it's something that I feel should be uh, fixed pricing instead of trying to figure out how many receptacles you have in a place and count them. And, you know, that's a dollar for this and five dollars for that. And this electrical service costs this much, but that one costs that much. I think it's something that we should really look at and, and uh, reevaluate the. Um, fees that we charge because, you know, we are a, a fee-based department. Uh, so what we're bringing in, you know, what does the general fund want to put into our department versus what we take in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And when I first heard about that, I was just kind of stunned because I feel like this is a great opportunity to simplify a process, not only for our residents that are getting new developments or having their buildings be inspected, uh, but also simplify it for our staff. Because every time a staff member has to go out there and count up the outlets and that kind of thing, um, this would save a little bit of their employee time uh, that they could spend doing something uh, more productive. So I just wanted to kind of bounce that idea off the commission and uh, our city manager and just see if that might be something willing, uh, we're willing to look at and see if we could get uh, some more money out of by simplifying it. Because with those fixed rates, we would save employee time from going out there and also it would probably end up being a, a little bit of an increase. 
Is that something we'd be willing to do? I think it's wise to uh, look at every uh, every progress. I mean, every process that we have to make sure that it's updated. You know, I think it's a good idea to do that, and with the uh, feedback of uh, Kevin and uh, Mr. Lacour. Commissioner, you're talking about the permitting process, and and pricing too, and, or or the pricing, or both. 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 So I thought we did a. Uh, uh, Maybe it has been 2013, I don't know, but I thought that uh, Anthony did something where he tried to streamline the process in terms of uh, like doing a lot of it online. And I think, didn't he have some initiative where inspectors were basically using tablets to sign off? Yeah, on it's just not on the fee. We just haven't touched it. Yeah, look, but look, the process the we've process. worked on, but yes. not the fee structure. Yes. Okay. The, the, the process was touched a little bit, not fully. Yes, right. the, the inspectors do have tablets in the field. There are other processes that we can do within the, the department to streamline it. Um, we're not there yet, something that we should probably look at. But our fee schedule there again was has not been touched since 2003. Right. We get a lot of people that tell us we're the cheapest game in town. Um, so it's something that we should, should I, I think we should look at if that's the direction this commission wants to go. I'll definitely look at it and, and bring things to you. And then there, there again, look at um, you know, having just fixed pricing on things, not trying to, you know, it's $40 for this plus another $5 for that and then $20 for this. It should just be a flat fee where you should be able to look at and say, this is what my permit's going to cost. Right. Yeah. Kevin, since we're speaking about these, the uh, customer uh, apply for an application online so you don't have to come here and, you know, present to do that? Is we. Right now, we don't have the ability to do that. I've been looking at um, uh, online plan review, which would enable contractors to submit all of that to us electronically. We talk about going paperless, and sure. and uh, you know we we take in reams of paper for a single permit instead of just bringing in it electronically, and then being able to have the ability to move that around electronically. That's something we should look at too. Um, you know, if that's the direction we want to go, then. Um, you know, that, that's where a lot of the departments are going to. Uh, I was just wondering, Mr. LeCour, if we have the ability to do that with the uh, system that we have in place. Um, I don't believe so. I think it's going to be the cost. No, there's going to be cost. There, I've, I've been looking. There, there is a cost to, to do that. Like everything, uh, we're going to have to look at an upgrade and a cost into doing that. Okay. But again, within the review, he'd bring you with the fees and what, the, for instance, Cost of that, I think something's going to be somewhere eighty thousand, not somewhere ballpark or something. Mm -hmm. That's another case where, where with the fees that we'd be generating from updating the fees and and making them simpler, two phases. That yeah. may be something who, who, that could fund that. When you're talking about the money and putting it back into there for the simplification, that would probably be all in the whole presentation that we would bring back to you, um, um, if if that's what you'd like to see at a later time. Yeah. Obviously, it's going to take a little more time than you know by the next budget meeting but it, it's something we can do during the course of of the year not something we necessarily have to to budget right now yeah, yeah. to bring back the whole package to you and then you can look at all components of the package and you know go here go there um where the board decides to go after looking that yeah. so I'm, I'm sure he he's he's he'll be waiting for us to, to put that together to to bring back to you if that's what you request i uh, suggest that you get the it department involved as well mm -hmm. yeah I, I have uh, spoken with Suzanne on uh, some of the, the, the programs. We, we've sat in on um, teleconference on it, and, and I believe the system does work for it. So we, we have been looking into it. It's just if we can st streamline the process and uh, bring something in electronically and pass it out to all the departments and they're being pinged with an email, so we should be able to have our, our – um, plan review times taken down dramatically. You know, we, we bring a set of plans in and now we have to pass it off to other departments. And before it gets to us, it's, you know, two, three weeks, four weeks into the process before it even gets to the building department. So yeah, if that's where we want to go, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, start putting things together. And I think if I'm not mistaken, Ron, isn't there somewhere in all of your budget documents where I think that one particular thing he's talking about is in the request but not funded uh, area. 
just a little, you can also look again as we're looking at what projects we want to add, delete, change, millage rate. There's there's a list of where some things that were asked for in the budget is not funded yet. It's on, we call it standby. It's on standby right now. We had an e plan review software, $125,000 is what we had budgeted. I'm not sure if that's still current. But that's probably high, he says. So it's not budgeted. It's, <laughs> no, it was it's not in the budget. Yes. But again, that's something his study that he's talking about could get all those figures refined and, and, and everything, and we could bring back to the commission. Yes. It, can I comment? Uh, so, Kevin, if I understand that, that's going to help streamline the process potentially if you go electronic versus paper and could help get these applications through the, theoretically at a quicker rate. Am I yeah, it, it, it would get it through at a quicker rate because we would be able to bring it in electronically and then we would pass it to every department electronically. During that process, we're able to uh, set a timer on it where it's pinging them instead of. Uh, paper plans going and sitting on a desk and getting buried mm -hmm. and then you know uh, two three weeks later you're calling over and you get the uh, oh yeah that I, I've got that you know down here somewhere so it would definitely streamline the process and I know I, I think a lot of goals for people are to, to try to go as much paperless as they can we're bringing all that paper in now we have to scan it now we have to store it uh, you know we we've got to keep a commercial building for life of the building so we have big rolls of plans, or we have to put into the budget to scan those in electronically and store those electronically. So there, there's cost on, on either side of it. We want to try to get away from those costs where it comes in electronically and we're able to store it electronically. Yeah, that makes sense, I think. Overall, I would support something along those lines as well. And obviously, the evaluation of the fees and how you can use staff in a wiser uh, way with getting maybe the same amount of fees, I think I would support that as well, just at least evaluation of it first. Richard Donovan, you got something else that you want to add into that? No, that's great. Thank you very much for answering those questions. I think we got good direction here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you guys. Yeah, sorry sorry to derail it there, but I just think that's an opportunity to get some additional monies in. Um, so the main thing that I'd like to see in the budget is possibly eliminate our, our local business taxes. Uh, many counties and cities have successfully repealed their local business tax, and I believe that it's a win-win scenario for both business owners, residents, and the city. Uh, eliminating our local business tax creates a welcoming atmosphere for small business, saving owners headache, and additionally a few hundred dollars, uh, depending on what type of business they own. Uh, also, it's a free market, and I don't know if uh, a local business tax is really justifiable from a, a principal perspective. Uh, I want to let consumers and the residents of Tarpon Springs decide who has the privilege of doing business here and uh, not our local government based on you know which type of business they might own. Uh, on the city side, preparing and mailing local business tax receipts wastes employee time and costs the city uh, additional expenses for mailing and postage to get them their business tax receipt. Um, also, the taxes we're gaining from our local business tax, or the revenue we're gaining, excuse me, uh, it's budgeted to generate less than $145,000 uh, this upcoming year for our general fund revenue. Um, so I just don't really think that less than $145,000 is worth uh, hassling our, our business owners with. I think it would create a, a much better atmosphere. And again, I believe that we can make up the $145,000 by getting flexible, by looking at restructuring certain things, just like the permitting process. But I believe that eliminating local business tax would be the best thing for our local business owners, and it would make it a lot easier to do business here in Tarpon Springs, and it would even create a more welcoming environment. And even Pinellas County has done this. So if you create a business outside of you know, a, uh, a city area, the, the county actually has done this with pretty, pretty good success. So I just wanted to bounce that idea off you guys, and if you guys got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Did you say this is 145000 a year? Uh, yeah, sorry. If you guys want to turn to page 58 in your executive summary, it should be right there. And Ron, you can confirm this uh, or correct me, but I see on page 58, kind of towards the middle, uh, local business taxes, the budgeted 2020 is 144425 Is that correct? 
It's 139650 There are some other things within that uh, yard sale licenses and penalties within there, too. Okay, so even less. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I just want to get your guys' perspective on that. Uh, I think it's a good opportunity to show our, our small business owners here in Tarpon that we care about them, we're here for them. And, and also, it, it you know, we don't have an employee dedicated to business tax receipts. So every time they got to go through a business tax receipt uh, process, that's just taken away from another employee's standard time where they could be working on something, again, more productive. Um, really, I, I think it's just a hassle for business owners, and I don't really know if that's our city's role is, you know, to tell businesses based on their type, uh, yeah, you have this much money as the privilege of doing business here within our city. I think, you know, it is a privilege to do business here in the city, but let the consumers decide who's going to do business here in the city. Um, so what are your thoughts on this? I'm not really sure about doing that. I'm, I'm, of course, you're going to create a vacuum on, you know, you're going to be short of 139000 but also, how are you going to give track of all the businesses when they, they come to town? There can still be a business registration process, or there can still be a notification process. Uh, it, it, and again, this isn't something that's completely irregular. Pinellas County does it as a county. Multiple cities do it uh, within the Tampa Bay area. It's, it's not something that's completely foreign. It's not something I'm just randomly introducing. It's, it's just been done in the past in different areas, and it's, it's been proven to help their local business economy. Mayor. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'll give you some uh, feedback, Commissioner. Generally, for me, in my experience, in, in given uh, you know, incentives or breaks or something like this, this would be something that I would be more so uh, able to support if we were like in more of a down market as an incentive. Um, but, I mean, for a local business tax for... 125 bucks to have a license and you know in some cases it's 125 or whatever the case may be I don't think that that's that cumbersome uh, to a business right now and I don't think that I would do without the hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars or you know roughly whatever the case is um, and then you know to your to a point that you just made in terms of the staff time or whatever it you know costs us to generate that hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars as it relates to issuing the receipt or sending out the postage or whatever if you're still going to have a business registration and you're still going to have that correspondence, you're still going to absorb some form of cost as it relates to keeping track of those businesses or logging them or whatever. So I would be interested to know if Pinellas County or these other municipalities still have waived that business tax or if that's something that they did, you mm -hmm. know, in a few years ago. Um, saw incentives like this. Uh, Hernando County at one point waived, like, their impact fees, right, during the down market, and now they've brought them back. So, I mean, to me... If we were, you know, if it was 2008 or 2009, I'd be like, yeah, absolutely. We need, you know, all the businesses that we can get. So if it, you know, if we can help them by waiving that business tax, then let's do it. Um, but I don't think that now, you know, I don't think, I mean, while I'm all about incentives to businesses, I don't think that I would be willing to do without that, you know, plus $100,000 uh, right now. So that's just my opinion. Uh, I would just need some more information on this one. I'm not ready to jump and support this one fully yet. Uh, I do want to uh, acknowledge you though. I mean, these are some great ideas that you're bringing up that I haven't heard over the past couple of years yet. So thank you for looking at it in a different perspective and making some great recommendations. But this one right now, I'm not, I'm not there yet. So I, I would need some more further information on the idea uh, behind it. Um, so not yet. And again, just a thought, if you do the millage rate decrease and you do that, you're talking about removing 229,000 from this budget. So that's what all these things you have to do and want to reduce. You have to put that in the fact now you got to go into this budget and you got to take that money out. If, if you do the 90,000 for the one and you do this one, so now we're close to the 230,000. So when you come with these reductions, we're going to have to come back the 19th of our budget time and see what are we not doing within this budget to go along with that. Again, I appreciate the. Uh, the idea that I appreciate you bring forward. I am more interested to give a break to the uh, every resident in Tarpa Springs, not just to the uh, her businesses. Yeah, and again, I still, I still and look at that and see. Yeah, it it is yeah. definitely the same mindset as the decrease of the of the millage rate. I mean, again, I know for certain businesses it's just over a hundred dollars. Um, uh -huh. But what business doesn't want just over a hundred dollars? And also, you know, the the non hassle of 
not having to register their business based on you know whatever type of business they may be. Uh, but again, uh, I'll get more information for you guys. I'll send it out in an email. Um, but also, just keep in mind, you know, it's that same mindset as the millage rate. Yeah, we're reducing something. Yeah, we got to make that money up somewhere. But really, it's just trying to make just like the residents' lives easier. It's trying to make it easier to do business in our town. That's good, but you cannot keep adding to that same thing. You know, uh, right now we're talking about reducing the millage. Let's work on that, and perhaps we can look at that next year. Okay, so do you guys want more information on this, or no? Do you want it to die? I will be more interested for next year than it is for this year, in my opinion, since we are discussing about reducing the millage. I'll evaluate anything. So, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm up for evaluating anything and turning over every rock. So, additional, I'm never turning away additional information, as Mark knows. <laughs> you know my thoughts. I'm out for now. Okay. Okay. I won't waste my time with it then, but I, I do think it'd be good to draw a line then somewhere in terms of what, you know, what amount of money are we willing to sacrifice for cuts in costs, cuts in taxpayer. I mean, when wh where do we draw that line, you know? Because we're fine with doing it for the millage rate, but then, you know, once once we add all that together, that's too much, that's fine. But it would be nice to have kind of a ballpark figure of, of where we're going to draw the line for each budget. Um, all right, now on to my, my questions. So <laughs> thanks, guys, for bearing with me. Um, my next point is I, I, I would just ask that in this budget, uh, five hundred dollars to a thousand dollars to make the entryway a little bit more uh, welcoming for residents coming into City Hall. I I know uh, a couple months ago we had a city accessibility uh, topic be brought up. Um, it seemed like we kind of reached a, an agreement at the end there that maybe we could be a little bit more welcoming for our residents. So I think even if it's just a few hundred dollars to you know get a help desk sign in there, maybe put some local artwork in there, put a, a bench in there so they can wait in there instead of having a bother the building department if they have to sit down and wait for somebody. And we're actually um, looking at n t now with money within this budget we have this year, we're looking at some of those I ideas to do some of that. So okay. if, if, if we don't, because I'm, I'm thinking we have some to do it this year, but if we get to the 12th and I think we don't, um, or we got most of it and we need to add a thousand or something, but we are looking for that, those features to do within this budget we have now. Um, before this one, so okay. before October. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, that, that's just something super little, but I think it'll make a big difference. Um, also, uh, Mr. City Manager, I just want to get an update um, and kind of bounce this off you. I, I know the commission was approached recently by, I think, uh, Turn the Tides for Tarpon regarding a sustainability manager. Uh, some cities have been hiring them uh, in our area, and it was my understanding that uh, the city was going to kind of wait for the sustainability committee to get up and running before we, we looked at moving further with it. And then maybe there were some additional positions from, you know, various departments in the future that had already been kind of allotted their, their slot uh, kind of on our waiting list of when new positions were going to be created. So that's, that's just what I thought for now, but I just want to get a quick update yeah, on that. Uh, again, and, and, you know, we haven't got to the cut list yet, and we may get that within personnel. Yes, there are, are probably two or three positions that we could really use in this budget that we're probably not gonna be able to fund within this budget. But on the idea of the sustainability person and stuff, the idea was to get the the sustainability committee up and running. Despite what everybody says, we do have a sustainability person. That person is Paul Smith and all of his experience. So we do have a person that is doing those things. Now to get somebody to assist them or form, in fact, you know, it may run eventually into one of those, but We'd like to get that up going. Again, there's a position, again, to assist in, in, in a couple other places that we're looking to see how this budget, but you know, in the course of doing this budget the last several months, I'm telling some people on some essential positions that we probably need that we probably have to wait. We probably can't get them into this budget year. So putting that above them, unless you know, there's something else going on, but that was the intention. Get up, have that committee working with Paul Smith, with, again, other resources from within the city that will assist Paul Smith as he needs it, Bob Robertson, some other ones with some of these sustainability projects. I think we should look at that first, see how that goes, and if that issue is to come up the uh, earliest, it would come up in the next budget season, not, not this one. As we look at that one and the additional positions 
and then weigh those out. Here are the three or four we need and the priority and look at that. But I, I just, within, within what we're trying to fund and all we're trying to do in this budget, as you see, as we're balancing this, you know, I just don't see the place for it in this budget this year. Okay. Thank you. I just want to get an update on it for sure. the public or anybody watching. Um, if you guys want to go to page 35 in your executive summary, uh, real quick, I just had a quick question. Um, it's in the smaller book. Next yeah, that's the smaller book. It's uh, this one. Uh, if you guys look on page 35, I just wanted to know um, our grant, our grant funds for our, our revenue summary. Uh, I just want to know why there were there were some decreased expectations. Um, I know I was really excited about the grant committee, the internal grant committee being formed. I, I was pleased to see, um, you know, the grant calendar being made. I was getting really excited about it. I just want to know if this is just kind of a ballpark figure or, or why our, our expectations are kind of tempered to uh, to go down a little bit, actually, for grant funds we receive this next uh, budget season. And I, I don't know if Ron or... Uh, Probably Ron Clark, but thanks. He's very conservative. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I, you know, I loosen it up a little bit. <laughs> um, grant funding you're talking about, uh, under the sure. 2020? Yeah, the, just- Most um, of that's a safer grant right now. 144,000 and the 273,000 is a transfer coming in from the general fund to cover that 65% for the safer grant. Okay, so is this just something that fluctuates throughout the year? I mean, if we can get a grant, great, it'll increase. It depends, you know, I think another 50, we've got another, uh, well, we get some recycling grant that comes in about 18,000 every year. We used to, I don't think we're getting any, we used to get an NEA grant. I don't think we're getting that, but that's mostly, it's mostly the safer grant and recycling grant, the current ones. Hey, this, these that are grants you actually know about, and for instance, we're going after and get a 1.6 million storm, well, you wouldn't be anticipating those ones. You just anticipate in the, the grant funds that we pretty much know we're getting. Yeah, the stormwater, the one point three million, that's in the stormwater fund. That grant. Okay, all right. Thank these you. aren't these are grants that just aren't, you know, can be put in, you know, pegged in the other funds like stormwater. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. But yes, our goal with that committee, as you said, and what we're going, as you see, as we've got started, is to get that number up as high as we can get it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. But until it's a known or we're able to get something, he wouldn't necessarily put it in here as anticipating it just because we're going to apply for a bunch of them. Yeah. Um, but we plan to, and again, we plan to try to get that number as high as we can. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and then if you guys want to turn to page 42, um, I just had a quick question here. Maybe, maybe it was a simple answer. Um, I just wanted to know uh, in terms of our expenditures, uh, the aid that we're giving, uh, we're given less aid right uh, in in this upcoming budget. We're given less aid than we have in every other year that's listed on here. Um, I just wanted to know why the substantial decrease in aid we're giving, or, or maybe it's from a different fund or from a different place. You say page 42? Yeah, page 42. Line 82 and 83. Aid to private organizations and other grants and aids. I could try to get back with you on that. I'm not sure exactly which ones are falling into that category right there, but I can get back with you on what you know what's in those aid categories. Okay. Yeah, and just for the record, yeah, I mean the past few years, I mean we had budgeted 136,000, 115,000. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what it is. It's a CRA. We budget a little bit less for the facade grants. Okay. I know it come to me sooner or later here, but <laughs> Okay. No, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't I wasn't missing something there. What page was that? Page That's a clarifying question real quick. So that doesn't talk about like the organizations that the city donates money to, right? Or is like the um, Safe Harbor or some of the other organizations, does that fall in that same category? Does that fall in the age to private organization? Because I know yes. it used to be every year used to be 10,000, but last, but we did not fund the Homeless Leadership Network, which was 5,000. I'm not sure where that other 3,852 came from because- uh, Yeah, the Safe Harbor- falls under that point eighty three, the grants and aids. Yeah. 
I just don't know where the, I know 5,000 of it's safe harbor, but I don't know where the other 3852 comes from. Well, I guess uh, the majority of that's the uh, you know, facade grants and the CRA fund. In the, in the age to private organization lines, 83 I'm talking about. Well, we had that one amount for eight thousand eight hundred dollars in two thousand eight. That was dealing with a it was donation money for uh, there was a, a I think a child that was going through some issues and stuff, and the money was raised, and that's where we paid that out. If that's what you're talking about, okay. so that's why you showed it there. Yeah, like for accounting purposes, we we got together. They raised some money for this child. I think it was part of the fire department and stuff. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I, oh, that's okay. But it's in there because for your accounting purposes. And yes. Stuff. Not like we spent the money has to go in and then go out. Right. So that's why it's okay. Uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to see if we had any updates on the possibility or any quotes of a new website. Or, um, you know, I, I know on page 67 we see our, thankfully, our, our IT um, expenses are, are increasing. So our IT department is getting more responsibilities. It's, it's growing. That's awesome. Uh, We're working on that right now. Okay. And are, are we also just, are we bouncing it around if maybe our, we could do it internally with our own? We're, we're doing it internally, um, getting, an, getting some kind of assistance on a smaller scale or also getting somebody to come in and do it. Um, we also want you to look at some facets of the new Explore Tarpon website to come in, what you like about that, what you don't, because the forum, and we did that very inexpensively with a group that just assists us forming it. Um, but we're looking at all three of those. If we, you know, what we can do in the house, what we can do with a little assistance, you know, in the ten, fifteen thousand area of somebody helping us build and and get to the points where you talked about doing, or if it's the thing we've just got too much information to put in and stuff, we just have to bite the bullet and go out and get one. We're looking at all three of those aspects and studying those right now to bring back to Bye. you. Thank you. Um, and then actually, sorry, this is my last thing. Uh, if you guys open up your binder just to page six in the big binder. Uh, I just noticed on line 40 it said travel per diem uh, for the Board of Commission travel to historic preservation, legislative events, and other conferences, and it was $2,000. I, I just wanted to know what happens when, when this money doesn't get spent. Or, or maybe maybe it was all spent <coughs> last year in a previous budget. Um, I, I just wanted to know what happens to any of this money as far as our commission travel per diems that don't get spent. Where does that money go? Does it go back to the general fund? or It, it goes, uh, for instance, when you're looking for money, for instance, to do the hallware stuff and there's extra money available and you know there's something not spent. I don't know if Ron can figure what we're talking about. But any of these categories is when we're at the end of the budget is now and I'm looking for money for either sign or for, for additional money to do those things in the lobby. That's why I, why I say this is a time we can look, okay, we know there's no conferences here or we know this money's not 3,000 you know, 3, here, 2,000 there, 3,000 there. I've got 5,000 to do a renovation or do a sign or do something like that. So usually at the end of a budget, that's where you look for to do some of those projects that, um, you know, the list that we've talked about, the list that we have of projects that we want to do beautiful and those kind of things, we'll look and try to do that. But I don't know on their, on their travel money and stuff, I think most of that is, I don't think we get much at the end of the year for that, for their, for, for that particular category on the city commission travel. Are you talking about if there's money left over in that, in that line? From our per diem, just wondering if we don't spend that two grand we had allotted there. Um, but I, I think it got answered, just that that's where we'd use okay. for any. If you don't spend it, if it's just not okay. used somewhere else within the department, it goes back into unassigned fund balance. And, and that's okay. for all funds, right? All. I mean, that's all yeah. that's that's all it. the budget that we're looking at. Yeah. It goes back if it's back. not used. Yeah. Okay. And cool. All right, I'm, I'm good on that. For yeah. instance, when, when there's been, for instance, coming up the Florida League of Cities, a lot of times there's only one go, but I think last year, the year before, we ended up having three going, three commissioners going to it, which was for the first time. Well, we went way over in that budget. So that's where you took some of the budget on the other lines and stuff where you found that they're not going to spend money here or somewhere else um, because, you know, three commissioners went, to, which, which is good, if, you know, if everybody could go. Um, but that line fell way short. So you look for one of those areas where you didn't spend the money, and then that goes and balances for there for the travel or something that comes up. Okay, thank you. That's it for me. That's it.
Well, that finishes the. Uh, I had a couple things, Mayor. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Stuff yeah. On the general fund, okay. if that's all right. No, no, that's fine. Uh, just in flipping through it, kind of refresh my memory on some things. Uh, historically, the vacant positions have uh, have always kind of stuck out to me in terms of, and as we're trying to balance this budget, and I know that, you know, vacant employee positions, in some cases, they're vacant and they need to be filled, or they're vacant and we just haven't found a qualified person or whatever. But just, you know, and briefly flipping through, for example, in the uh, in the library, we have two vacant positions. Now, I don't, I don't know that they don't need to be filled. I'm just saying they're vacant and they total somewhere around, you know, I don't know, $60,000. So that's just in the library. So, you know, moving forward as we're, as we're figuring out whether or not we need to find 90000 100, 120, whatever the case may be, you know, some of these vacant positions to me, unless it's an essential position that needs to get filled, is a great way to try and come up with some of that money. So I wanted to throw that out there. Um, and flip yeah, remember, we need to give you an updated list, too, because when he prints that, if, if somebody's not in a position, if we're advertised or we're two days from hiring, it still shows if vacant. when he does that, it's going to show vacant, right. even though the person. Well, that's my so, point. So, yeah, we need to get you that updated of, because right. some of those might and have been And that's what I would ask filled. for yes. in our next meeting, the, right. a, a list of vacant positions, how long they've been vacant, and, and if I, they're essential or not. Right. If they're not essential, then wipe them out of the budget, and we come up with some extra money. Right. Um, and then I saw $27,000 in sponsorships, and I was curious what that's for, what we sponsor that costs $27,000. But that's a sponsorship we're getting for cultural, and I know Diane's been doing a great job of getting sponsorships for the performances and that, uh, going out to, uh, like, Advent, adv out. Advent Health. Yeah, getting money in. We're anticipating that we're going to get it from a sponsor. Gotcha. That's not always a figure. We hope, we hope to get that. But we're getting the money in. Coming. In, uh, in roads and streets, I saw that there's uh, $9,000 in crushed concrete. And my question would just be, I'm pretty sure we have a stockpile of crushed, crushed concrete at the Waystar facility, no, Tom? Tom. It might, might be a Tom question. Yeah, he's, a, he's the crushed concrete. <laughs> I mean, man. and not to mention in projects that we do, we have a supply from our own recycling of crushed concrete crushed concrete so i'm curious why we're budgeting nine grand for that oh we well crushed concrete is a, is a product that we use all the time we don't have it actually stockpiled at the yard waste what you see at the yard waste is actually uh, uh roof shingles gotcha. uh, ceramic roof shingles we use for the roadway out there mm -hmm. uh but crushed concrete is a product product that we have to purchase do we yes sir gotcha. but we do when we do a project and we bust concrete up we obviously recycle it for our own use right well, we send it to a recycling plant we send it uh we don't have the, the capability of actually crushing it and turning it into, into a fine aggregate uh, so we actually we just sent it back to a plant, and then so that's actual like finer aggregate, not just material crushed concrete material that we would use for like shoreline stabilization. Right. We will save some of our cr our broken concrete for shoreline uh, right. repairs, but most of it goes back and gets recycled, crushed back down, and used for other purposes like road. So it's base. a finer material, not just big chunks. Right. Gotcha. Right. Uh, and then I saw we got a couple grand for flowers and plants for tr and shrubs and stuff within the CRA. I'm just curious why we don't try and uh, get that two grand out of the uh, tree or the tree fund? Uh, well, I don't believe I believe we're prohibited from doing that from the tree fund. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Which is an ordinance that could be subject for change in the future if that was so the case of of the wishes of the commission. It's not a bad idea to review it though. Yeah, I mean, like we, I mean, in charge. recent history, you we've know? kind of flirted with like, mm, can we use tree? I mean, if Still we have a half a million bucks, yeah, the tree fund. I was going to say we've got quite yeah. a bit of money That's there just point. sitting there. Yeah, right. I agree. Should look at it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mayor, can I make one comment, just for the record? Yeah. Uh, I just want to point out, and it's a reminder every year that it, uh, if you have an opportunity to buy gasoline in the city of Tarpon Springs, I would encourage you to buy gasoline in the city of Tarpon Springs. The city receives a small tax for fuel tax. So if you're fueling in Pasco, you're fueling in Palm Harbor, or you're fueling other areas, the city of Tarpon Springs doesn't get that tax. So by refueling your vehicle in the city of Tarpon Springs, we receive revenue from that. So I would encourage the residents to do that. Good commercial. Mm -hmm. I like that. <laughs> I'm working for Sunoco. Yeah. Put it on the bus. I want the money to come here. Yes. OK, that finishes up the uh, general fund, and we go to uh, enterprise fund. The first. Uh, Let's start with the uh, sanitation, which is the smallest one, one of the smallest ones. Um, the only question that I have is, uh, we're getting close to uh, the, uh, the the agreement that we have with the uh, waste manager to expire. Is that correct? And are we getting getting ready for negotiations for that? 
How does uh, that work? Two more, two more years. Oh, two more years. Yeah. So we're good. So in two yeah, more we years. Got, we got a little room, yes. Okay. I really don't have any any other questions. Uh, any? Uh, uh, yeah, I got a quick question. Uh, page two twelve of the binder <clears throat> under miscellaneous. It says interest on investment. Uh, the actuals for two thousand eighteen was seven hundred thirty five dollars. Two thousand nineteen budgeted was uh, fifty five hundred, and in twenty twenty we're going to twenty five thousand. So I'm just curious. That, that's a wrong one. That's a wrong one. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't expect that you pay for that. Huh? We're in, we're in, the, in the sanitation fund there? Yeah, sanitation, page 212 of the binder. Yeah, I was budgeting based on the, 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 the way the rates have been increasing based on the 3%. You know, sometimes I might be revisiting that to see how the rates go, especially when the Fed meets at the end of this month. But, yeah, I, it had increased the rates. You know, we're obviously we're trying to get as much interest earnings as possible, or trying to leave as little in the checking accounts, leaving enough there but trying to make sure we've got the money invested, not just, not just not just sitting around in the checking account. So in between last year and this year, you've reinvested the money in, in a different manner? Yes. Gotcha, good for you. Um, on your handout, page 33, uh, it says city administrative fee is 20%. I was hoping you could elaborate on that and what that means. Yeah, that's a that's a 20% that's added on to the contractor rate for the on the contractors. It's to cover the uh, solid waste employees. We've got about five employees in the solid waste department and also to uh, help cover the recycling department, the expenses and the operating expenses in there. So you're saying this 20% comes from the general fund to help fund the sanitation, is that right? No, this is on the sanitation fees that go out to the customers for refuse and recycling on top of the contractor rate. 20% is added on to the contractor rate in the customer's bills. So the 20% is a fee that we collect? The city collects it, yes. For admin fees, is that right? Yes, gotcha. to help for the operations. Okay. Uh, I'm good. Mission color? Is this specifically for stormwater, or I mean sanitation? Sanitation. Okay. Um, if we could talk about real quick, it has a 1.78% increase on one of the pages in the presentation, Ron. I believe uh, 33, mentioned a couple times, I believe. The 1.78, is that the contractual increase? Um, yes, per the contract with waste management, they go up per, by based on the consumer price index. And so when we figure it out based on that, it, this year it, or for next year, it's coming in at 1.78% based on the contract. Okay, thank you. Also, uh, recycling, I brought this up in years past. Um, a little bucket that we, as residents, receive, uh, part of being a city resident. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just, I think there's so much recycling that's being used now that it's not actually, the people that are recycling, there's multiple buckets, it's overfilling. Um, I think it would be best for the city to look at some avenues to actually have a larger bucket for recycling if we're going to be providing buckets. <coughs> maybe we stop providing them, I don't know. Um, but they're, they're a tripping hazard. you got to bend over, hurt your back, pick them up, and stuff like that. So um, sometimes I have more recycling than trash out at the curb and almost need a, a reverse uh, of the buckets. Just want to bring up at that point. Um, secondly, I, I've talked to the city manager about this as a, an item. Um, so some people might not be aware, but um, sanitation obviously goes back for many, many years. We've had trash to where the historic homes, you dig around the historic homes, you might find old bottles, you might find old tents where people would bury their trash or maybe they'll burn it in the backyard. Um, and then the city of Tarpon Springs actually had their own dump uh, where the current waste yard is today. Um, and that's just a bunch of green land. There's some trees out there as well. It's not being used really other than a small portion of it's being used for the yard waste facility. Um, and talking about revenues and some of the other aspects is thinking, how do we create more revenue for the city of Tarpon Springs? And one of the discussions was, and I know there's been some discussions about putting a ball field on this area and there's some other things that need to be done, which I'm in support of that as well. But this might be an alternative idea to look at as well is looking at a solar panel field um, as a as a using this space, so it's a, a big space that's not being used really for anything other than a small portion of it. Um, you can't really build on it because of the old history of the property. 
Um, and then if we could sell the electricity back to Duke Energy, it could be an opportunity to create a revenue stream for the city that the city doesn't have today with the renewable resources moving forward into the future. So I'd like to make that recommendation within the sanitation fund. Um, that could be an opportunity to use um, to create some revenue on the sanitation side. And that could help alleviate some of the collections as well, cost-wise, if so be. I think the, one of the things to look on look at for that commissioner is the, uh, I think in order, and just in talking with Paul Smith about the uh, solar panels and how to try and better utilize that is you have to be within a certain distance to the grid to get the power to the power plant. Is that right, Paul? Is that feasible from the... No. If, if, you, if you may, Vice Mayor, I was talking to a uh, solar panel company and it said as long as you have a, um, a building that um, has a meter at it, so there would be the building where the way house is, it has a meter, you could put it back into the grid for Duke Energy. And that's when I talked to a consultant or a, a local company about it because I inquired about it. He said all you have to have is a, a building that pulls electricity. So... It would be the weight house that has the electricity going to the um, the weight house, and I don't know how much it is a year, probably less than a couple thousand dollars. Um, but then it could go back through that meter. To do From the weight house? Yeah. Is that your understanding, Paul? Well, there's a lot of considerations. It's a great idea. Um, there's also a capacity consideration. You know, working with Duke Energy, the limit for most contracts is 2 megawatts. And I think if you were to really do that right, you could really put out more than that. So it would put us into an uncharted territory. We'd really have to talk it out with them and see if they'd want to net meter with us because that's what we'd have to do is get it back into the grid. They'd have to agree to it. So right. there'd need to be a lot of stuff worked out. We'd have to also look at when we're penetrating that cap out there mm -hmm. that's designed to prevent the groundwater from getting into the old waste in the landfill. There's a lot of considerations there. I know we're getting close to the end of its closure period, so we'd have to work with DEP to see if they think it's safe to put, you know, the, the things that hold the panels up, you have to drive them into the ground. Sure. And that's considering penetrating that clay cap that's out there. So um, it's a great idea. I mean, there's yeah. really a lot of benefits to it, but just a lot of things we'd have to work through. I think the capital costs would be pretty significant, too. I, I've looked at some case studies and some of the larger ones on brownfield sites, contaminated sites, I mean, these are 10 plus million dollar projects. So we're, we're talking pretty big numbers. Um, has some great benefit potential. I, I believe it's a great idea also, but uh, Mr. Smith, um, I remember, if I remember correctly, the area that uh, we're talking about has been capped and gas, we cannot drill on there because gases will escape into the atmosphere if I'm right? Yes, and we, we do be careful with monitor that. it every year. Um, it is getting the, towards the end of its monitoring period, but I just don't know the details of what that all means. Does it release us from any of those concerns anymore or not? I think we'd uh, still have to deal with it. It's worth looking at it, and being that we're using a special air like this, I wonder if there's any grant available that can help us with that. You know, from the, from the federal government, so it's worth looking at. It. Yeah. Okay. Any other uh, suggestion? So that's it for sanitation. Okay. Commission Donovan. Uh, yeah, I just had one quick one. Um, in 2018, the budget accounted for um, some some revenue expenses, whatever, thirty-eight thousand five hundred twenty-five dollars from intergovernmental revenue. Um, I just want to know what that was. What's that from? I don't know who I'm asking here. I probably Ron. <laughs> it's on page. It's on page 79. And it's just that 2018 revenue that says intergovernmental, and no other year has any intergovernmental revenue. So I just want to know what that was from, and if we could ever get that again. 79. No, 79. But you're sorry, you're stumping me on that one. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I know. I plucked a random number off the page. You can just email me about it if you'd like. Oh. <laughs> Hurricane Irma. Uh, That's okay. a portion for this. We did get something. <laughs> okay. So. You almost stumped me. Come on, this is Stump Ron. We got to stump him. <laughs> okay. That's, that's my only question for that. Thank you. Okay. So that takes care of the uh, sanitation. And now we'll go to the uh, water and sewer. Well, 
example, the total revenue on that is twenty million dollars, one hundred and fifty-nine thousand. Uh, Ron, three million two 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 hundred and sixteen thousand comes from non-revenue reserves. Would you please explain what this fund is for? Yeah, that that is money that's coming from reserves to handle the capital projects in the water and sewer fund. It's it's based on the uh, rate study that we have done that was planned on that we'd be using these reserves, you know, from the water and sewer fund. So what do we do? We just transfer it every year into the uh, account. Is that what well? It's it's basically money that's in the in the in the reserves. It's savings, if you want to call it, that's going to be used uh, for the capital projects. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to uh, detail a little bit more for the record. Um, and Ron, I think this would be for you. Um, when we first met, I, I had a lot of questions about it. You put my mind at ease about it, at least more than it was. Just the debt regarding the, uh, the plant, um, I just wanted to verify. It's roughly $2 million a year every year until we pay it off. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Because I just see, I, I know it was a million and then a million, it looks like in 2018, but now it, it jumps it's to... It's two million forty thousand a year. Okay. For, so so now it's just going to be pretty much roughly two million from here and yep. until, I, I don't know the math on that, what is it, like 30 years left or... Um, six million, there's about six million left that goes to 2038 and the balance about six million, about 20, 26 million goes to 2042. Okay. All right. There's two parts of the bond issue. Okay. That's my only question for that one. I just wanted to, to ask that. Thank you. Where, uh, are we on uh, sanitation still? No, we're on water and sewer. Water and sewer. All right. Uh, have you spoke yet? Not yet. Okay. Commissioner Carr. Thanks, Vice Mayor. Um, Paul, you mentioned something in... Uh, when we talked about the general funds, about peak versus non-peak usage of the electricity at the water plant, uh, can you touch on this a little bit further and let me know about um, if the city tries to pump or clean water during non non-peak hours, or if this is being I, I imagine it is with you being in charge, but I just want to double check that that's the strategic approach that it's being taken. Yeah, we have most of our staffing during the daytime, and um, we want to be staffing that facility while we're operating the RO process. So that really drives the daytime operation. We have looked at the rates, and we actually consult with Duke to find the most cost-effective um, schedule to do that. So we are working on that, and that's something that changes. You know, we reevaluate that each year. So the short answer is yes, we're looking for the lowest cost way to produce it. But we are sort of constrained by um, needing to be manning that facility or staffing that facility when that part of the process is happening. Okay, that's something we could look at as a city, or the city could look at staffing during the night hours if we need to as well, right? If there, if it's beneficial in that aspect from a budget standpoint. Yes, but that would be a major personnel consideration to move basically the majority of the staff to nighttime. Okay, I mean, I think it's good to continue to evaluate this uh, from a cost perspective yeah. overall um, is the mark correct me if I'm wrong but is um, the sewer line and water line replacement that's going to be under the capital projects next next meeting yeah probably okay um, I did actually I have one other question for stormwater too I forgot to ask uh, okay so this is a, a topic that I it pertains to stormwater, it pertains to water, uh, it pertains to um, sanitation. So there's administration fees that um, is scheduled each year to go from these enterprise funds and paid into the uh, general fund. And I believe the description is to, um, in the previous budget uh, summaries, the description has been to cover um, HR services, um, roadway usage, um, management services, um, et cetera. And I don't have the exact cost this year on where we're at from a proposal standpoint. Um, but Ron, is that something you could share uh, from the past couple of years? Do you have those numbers handy by chance? 
It's the administration charge or administration fees from enterprise funds to the general funds. And you, I, you mentioned something along the lines that the marina and the um, golf course were eliminated this budget year. Correct. And the, the ones we'll have is from the water sewer fund, the sanitation fund, and the stormwater fund. Right. So in years past, I mean, it's gone up significantly this year, I believe, right? It's close to $900,000. Where you give... For instance, the presentation we did in Florida for the budget advisory. Yeah, I got the this, presentation loaded this, here if you want. Yeah. 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 Because I think it's very important for us to understand how you got that, how we were looking at what the average was of the other cities, how we didn't want to put that all in one year on them. So you kind of spaced it to, because it's a very good process that you used to not to not go to what the standard is for all the other cities that you progressively got to where you are this upcoming year with the 8%. I think that's something good for the public to put that presentation up for the public and everybody to see um, the thought process you did in to get us to the point of, of what the normal administrative fees on and how you didn't put it all on in that first year. And you progressed to get to the point where now we're on the lower end or the average of what the other cities do for that. So I think that's a good story for the commission and for the public to, to see. Yeah, we've got, as you mentioned, administrative fees from the enterprise funds uh, to the general back to the general fund. Uh, the basic um, operation of it is account for operations that are financed operating in this manner, similar to uh, enterprise funds uh, account for operations that are financed and operating in a manner similar to private bene private business enterprises where the intent of the governing body is to recover all the costs, expenses, depreciation of providing goods and services to the, to the general public, uh, finance on a cost recovery. The, you know, the enterprise funds operate like a business, not like the general fund. They're basically more on a cash basis, no capital, no depreciation. Uh, all costs of the enterprise funds must be captured in order to reflect the true cost of the enterprise. All costs of enterprise funds, including admin charges, are approved as part of the budget process. Uh, enterprise funds have no staff allocated for administrative management functions. They are all in the general fund. To charge the enterprise funds for admin charges of, of the general fund, an allocation is performed which expenses these charges to the enterprise funds. That's these transfers that we do from the uh, enterprise funds. Uh, the methodology for allocating the admin charges is as a percentage of revenues of the enterprise funds. This allocation methodology is a widely accepted practice of municipalities following generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, admin charges of in enterprise funds budget in the general fund, what are they covering? Uh, purchasing does work, finance, uh, payroll, accounts payable uh, finance, HR, all employee services uh, from hiring, retirement, all benefit coordination and employees, IT, all computer equipment, software, maintenance, operations, support, uh, the board and city manager for their management services related to the enterprise funds. Uh, building development for permitting impact fees, uh, planning for all the planning services they provide, city attorney for legal issues, legal issues, facility maintenance for maintenance of the buildings of the enterprise funds, parks and parkways for maintenance of the grounds, roads and streets for maintenance of roads, sidewalks of the enterprise funds, and police and fire for all police and fire services provided to the enterprise funds. Uh, the city has five enterprise funds. As you know, the water and sewer, sanitation, and stormwater fund uh, the, are the ones that we're allocating the administrative charge. The fund's not compensating the general fund due to the financial constraints of, that, of those funds are the marina and the golf course fund, which was compens compensating through 2019. But like, say, 2020 is the first year we're discontinuing that, that uh, admin charge. Uh, the history of the admin charges to the enterprise funds uh, up through 2017, it was a flat amount and did not change except for the golf course fund. Water and sewer fund was at 620,000 or 3.64% of revenues. Sanitation fund was at, at that time was 206,000 or 4.14%. Stormwater fund was 114,000 or 7.53% and golf course fund was 134,740 or 9.42%. 
the amount was 275000 from the golf course. Really, that goes back to when they used to lease out the golf course, and that was a lease payment to the golf course fund. But we, like I say, we gradually have decreased that uh, due to the financial constraints of the golf course fund. In 2017, it was brought to my attention by our auditors that the compensation from the enterprise funds was especially, especially the water and sewer and sanitation funds was low. I performed my own analysis by using the number of employees in the enterprise funds compared to the total city employees, then using no number, those numbers and applying them to the budgets of the general fund departments where those employees are that provide those services to the enterprise funds. My own analysis came up with an average of 8% should be allocated for admin charges, which was higher when compared to the current rate of, we, well, we were only getting the 3.64% and 4.14% mentioned on the previous slide. At the same time I completed my study, our auditors informed me that the city of Dunedin had performed a similar survey of a cities in Pinellas County and certain cities of similar size outside of Pinellas County. The result of Dunedin's survey, survey was 8%. They came up with the same I have. It was decided we need to adjust the charge for admin charges to the enterprise funds. Uh, the belief was they needed to be consistent. As you can see before, they varied from 3% to 9% to the golf course fund before. Um, it was decided to institute the change incrementally instead of going straight from 8% back then in 2017. We thought, well, let's go. We'll do, we did 6% in 2018, 7% in 2019, and in this 2020 budget, we're do, we've done 8%. Um, we decided not to go back retroactively to recapture any loss due that we were, seemed like we were very low before. Uh, the administrative charge to the enterprise funds was reviewed by the Budget Advisory Committee in 2017, and we went over this presentation with the Budget Advisory Committee uh, just a couple weeks ago. I performed my analysis again just a couple weeks ago with the same methodology I used back in 2017, and my results were water and sewer fund came up pretty close, 8.02%. Sanitation fund came in a little higher at 10.44. Stormwater fund came in at 10.65, and golf course fund came in, in, came in at 9.8%. I also resurveyed re uh, cities locally. Dunedin is still currently at 8%, Oldsmar 10%, Largo 9%, and Clearwater is at 10.14%. Uh, just going back, all admin charges to the enterprise funds is approved as part of the budget process. The admin charges are also incorporated in the water and sewer rates study performed annually, which establishes the water and sewer rates. Our auditors also validated our admin charges methodology and percentage, and that's my presentation that was presented and the work that was done in coming up with that. Okay, um, can you clarify then, you said the employees are not um, paid out of the funds, they're paid out of the general fund? All correct? the employees are paid out of the general fund. And they're not charged to the, uh, that do the admin management work are not charged to the water and sewer fund directly. Okay. So, but like I'm seeing a public works executive assistant, there's sanitation, stormwater, public works director, sanitation, stormwater, GIS, stormwater. Um, these are different funds that are paying project administration, water, sewer fund, stormwater fund. Or these are Positions, project supervisor, water sewer fund, stormwater, project inspector, water sewer fund, stormwater. These are positions that are funded out of these enterprise funds based on what the personnel breakout is on page 47 through 49. So I just want to make sure I understand. I'm under, like seeing the, this correctly. If I'm understanding your presentation. The employees are paid out of the general fund, but then when I'm looking at the backup here, it says the split allocations are through these funds as well. So I feel like there's some type of contradictory that I'm missing here. Well, you've got you've got other employees. that, that Those are not the employees that are in the general fund. Those are okay. employees that are charged directly to the water and sewer fund for work, I think, directly related to water and sewer and the production of the water products and the sewer treatment. Okay. Understood then. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay. 
Uh, I mean, there's one problem I have from a commissioner's standpoint. Like, I feel this is additional tax to the residents that's going to the general fund that's not being approved from a millage standpoint. Uh, and I don't have the numbers in front of me. Uh, I had them pulled up at one point, but it was a, like, I mean, if I remember, it was like three or four hundred thousand dollars increase over the past couple of years to where we're at today in fiscal year 2020. So I was just had some concerns saying I just want to make sure it's full transparency that there's charges coming out of this. So, so we increase the water rate, the sewer rate, um, and the stormwater rate, but then we're pulling funds out of those funds that were increased the rates for their services and putting it into the general fund, which typically we see from taxes, from ad valorem taxes, revenue and for uh, permitting, et cetera. So it was just a red flag to me where I saw how large of an increase it is. Uh, what I'm encouraged by though is that the other cities and municipalities and the surveys that you've done, we align with that. Um, is it a creative accounting? I would say absolutely. <laughs> It's creative accounting and how you use this. Um, but since we align with the other cities, I think it's important that we're aligning that we're not going too far above and taking advantage of these other funds. Uh, it, again, it, it could fall into taking loans from other funds too. I'm in support of that still uh, to avoid debt costs um, and interest that you have to pay on that. So um, thanks for clarifying that for me. And I think that makes sense. Is this a question regarding the administrative fees, or is this stormwater? Something to do with the, anything with the water and sewer. Anything. Okay. Um, I had a quick question on it. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Carr, for bringing that up. Uh, I think you made some really good points. That um, certainly seems like creative accounting, but again, if all the other cities are in line with it, um, it seems like just the way of the game. Um, and I just had a quick question on page 92 in your executive summary. Uh, again, this this should be a pretty easy answer for you. Um, for our stormwater department under operating supplies, is that going up by over 12,000 just because we're doing more projects or we expanded the operation or are we just using newer products? How, how are those operating supplies increasing so steadily each year? We're doing the stormwater fund here? Yeah. So you're just trying to figure out what that increase is there in the stormwater? Yeah. I thought, weren't we no, just no, on stormwater water water sewer? sewer? So what the administration charges, they actually uh, impact sanitation, water, sewer, and stormwater. So there's, it impacts it actually multiple. Actually, all the uh, uh, enterprise yeah. Except the no, marina and the golf course. Because we decided not to, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's where the confusion is. Okay. So where am I right now? Water yeah. and sewer. Are you on 92, Ron? You see 92, line I'm under 92, it deals with 52. stormwater. I'm sorry? Line 52 on page 92. 12,000. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I said, but if we're not on stormwater, I, I can wait. Well, we might as well answer. We, we're all, we we're had, all There was some money budgeted for bank stabilization. Okay. Was it budgeted? That's an extra project. That, that's what he's kind of asking. That, the inquiry is, what is that for? Extra projects or... That's the question he's got. And what was the answer to? It's for some bank stabilization they budgeted for. What is that? You know, like Tom, retention. Might be a bank. Hey, the bank. Oh, the okay. I, thought, I, mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking like a bank, like a like an institution. No, not the bank in New York or anything like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> so the other way. That's Go back. Financial. Financial. Yeah. Go this, it's for areas we page. like uh, areas we have washouts alongside of uh, the hot banks. Yeah. It's it. As we add stormwater, we have to add more funds to maintain it. Okay, I thought bank stabilization too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor, I've got a couple questions on water and sewer. Sure. Um, let's see. Um, on page 228 of the binder, affluent sales, I'm, a, I'm assuming that means reclaimed water sales, Paul? Okay, so uh, in our recent discussions uh, as the BOC, we've determined that our, we're basically at capacity in terms of the amount of rec reclaimed water that we can sell. So my question is, if we're selling as much as we can sell and our rates are at basically an all-time high, how are we going down from $407,000 $407, in sales to 
$395,000 in sales. $395,000 in sales. Uh, it would be line, uh, I guess, 343, 61-03, affluent sales on page 228 of the binder. The reclaimed, you know, on, you look, you'll notice on all the water and sewer, and it basically, like I say, I said earlier, I mean, I'm being a little conservative, but uh, I'm seeing the use of water has declined this year. I'm hoping that it'll pick back up. So I, I reduced some of the, my revenue projections there. Hmm, I thought we were uh, using more reclaimed water than ever now. It, it's down this year. I, I've seen uh, I, my numbers so far through June, we've been down about 4% between water use and reclaimed use. I think with all the rain we've been having off and on. But. Okay. Uh, and then if you go further down that page of 228 under miscellaneous, uh, the actuals for 2018, you have a lot of miscellaneous numbers that I guess accumulate to $143,000 uh, of capital or revenues. Um, I guess you did some kind of restructuring regarding the interest on investments to get rid of all the little stuff and get one big return, which is the $200,000? Well, when we budget the interest, I just put it in that one line item at top there, huh. but really we've got interest that comes in from, I'm not sure what I'll be investing in, so there's more interest revenues from CDs, from right. the That's federal. what it says for the actuals of 2018. Those are the actuals from 2018. So those are still in place, you just don't know what they are yet? Correct, gotcha. and so when I budget for next year, I'm not sure where. The, Either case, I, you're budgeting, you're saying that we're going to make significantly almost twice as much money this year on investments than we did Like I say, year. that's when I was budgeting in December. We were getting over 3%. I don't know if I might cut it back a little or see. I'm, I'm pleased by it. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it, it's a trend across the board. It seems like in your investments, you're, yeah. you're budgeting that we're going to have more money this year than we did in years past, which is a good thing. Yeah. But it just is, you know. It I mean, sticks I could, out here because it, this shows one light item versus, you know, 10 or 15, which equate to a, a sum of numbers. I, I could try to estimate and, and put the budget all the way down those line items, but I, so far the practice has just been to keep it up on that one line item, and then as the year goes through on the actuals, you'll see it spread on the, like you see there. Makes sense. Um, and then on uh, our, our debt service is 10%, uh, and I'm wondering... You could elaborate on that. It's $2 million in debt service, and I guess most of that is in relation to the reverse osmosis plant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's all the debt service on the water plant. Okay. I'm good. Any more questions on the uh, water and sewer? I just had one more comment uh, about backflow charges, and I know I've talked to Paul Smith about this in the past. Um, I would feel that like once it's recaptured the backflow charge that the city doesn't charge for the backflow itself, but just a, a monthly fee. And once it's recouped, that you shouldn't be charged further in that aspect. And I, again, I think this falls in the whole water sewer fee structure, if I recall correctly. Um, can you touch on that one more time? I, I've had some other residents bring that up to me recently. Yeah, there's a monthly fee for uh, backflow preventers, um, usually installed on the water meter side of the system, and that's the protection for all of us as water customers. It keeps things from flowing back into the water main. It's required by law, but it's something that um, it isn't where you can just put one in and then forget about it. Um, they need to be replaced. They need to be maintained. They need to be tested. So it really is an ongoing expense for us. We have compared it with the market a few times just to see what a plumber would charge to do a similar type thing. We feel like our charges are in line with um, that part of the sector. So um, it's important. It's an important source of funding for us to continue to uh, keep that part of the system up. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Next is Marina. Wait, yeah. Uh, looking the uh, the numbers of uh, the enterprise fund seems like a very making it. Uh, Mr. Lecouris and Mr. Herrick, is that possible that is a possibility that we might run it out, or we have we done that in the past? Have we looked at it? What was your comment, that, man? I'm sorry. The renting out of the marina. Renting out of the marina. Talking about our slip charge. Yeah, well, no, no. The whole thing is. Uh, as a as business, yeah, right. like like it is. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I don't know if it makes any fi financial sense. Have we looked at it and see if, if that's possible? And Come at our rate? No, no. Just rent the whole thing out. Oh, okay. Like everything to a third party? Yeah. yeah. Or have someone else run yeah. the marina? Because the, it, right now, it's not making any money. We just put money into it. Huh? Just breaking even, basically. Yeah. I don't know. Is it worth it doing it? Maybe we need to look at it and see. I don't know if we've looked at that before. We we can we can come back on the yeah come back on the twelfth. I, you know. I don't know that I, I mean personally. Yeah. I I think our marina's it's it's such a size that I don't think it makes a lot of sense to operate as a third party. Um, especially now that we've just we're gonna have a brand new facility, right? So. I would just be in favor of just turning over a brand new facility to a third party operator. I mean, but I would be in favor of mayor is looking at it more so from a business perspe perspective as the city and saying, hey, are our are our slip rates in line or could we charge more for our slips or, you know, are our are we renting our or be more selective in our slips? Right. Like a number of years ago, it seemed like the slips went to just boats that weren't necessarily contributing anything to you know, bringing foot traffic to the to the dock or, you know, having business or having boats that actually operated as a business and they were more so just, you know, people looking for a relatively cheap uh, place to keep their boat. But, you know, going back 20 years, you know, that was like Charter Row, which is something that we've talked about trying to recreate with, you know, fishermen who have boats to bring customers to the sponge docks, to get customers from the sponge docks, and it's more so an actual, like, going back to the working port thing. So, I mean... Uh, I don't know. That's something that I would look at as we discussed the marina. As far as like our are our slip rates in line, or are we, you know, are we missing the boat and missing additional revenues that we could potentially get? Especially given now that we're going to have a brand new facility. You know what I mean? I think you know Tom and I were talking about with since it's being redone and stuff, and and increasing those slip fees on uh, at the marina there. Absolutely. You yeah, we, we do. I'm sorry, I had an alarm. I had to turn off. Uh, yeah, we're doing a, a survey right now on on the slip rentals, and we'll be coming back to you very shortly on the, on a proposal on on looking at those and then possibly increasing them. I'm trying to remember. There hadn't been a talk about you know a private or a third party in the marina for a while, except I think we had one case where I think with the Papasel or son, there was asking us a consideration of doing something with whoever was going to buy the property. Do you remember if we've had any of those discussions? I remember there's been probably quite a few years since that happened over here, uh, probably a good five or six years, but there was talk about someone taking over the old Paps right and, and leasing that piece of property. And they were, they were asking about the ability to do that, the, the marina. I think that's, that's the only right. time it's come up in the past. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, it, it's nice to have it, but, uh, I mean, it keeps losing money. Uh, right now, we don't... You know, we, we don't charge any operating fees at all. So we just barely break even. I don't know how much money do we invest in now to reconstruction the... Uh, 500,000. About half a million bucks. Uh -huh. 500,000. Yeah, about half a little more, yeah. But a million. if that half million dollars has a uh, mm -hmm. brand new looking facility over the course of, you know, 15 years mm -hmm. or 10 years, I mean, you depreciate it over that, that time frame. It's not that big of a deal. I mean, it's something that had been needed to be done for a long time. Mm -hmm. But I do think that, you know, for sure we need to have a survey done on our rates, given that we're going to have a brand new facility, yep. and then also uh, keeping in mind, you know, what we talked about. Is, I mean, and this is just my opinion. It's up to the will, of, you know, the will of the board. But, I mean, I think that it's very important to have, you know, there's only X amount of slips, right? What is there, 20, 20 slips? Actually, with the new configuration, it'd be 19. 19, okay. Mm -hmm. And then X amount are transient, right? Which is very important yes. in itself. The transient is probably the best uh, the best revenue we have coming in on that. Yeah. The transient is. The and transient it's is a good thing because it brings new people and mm -hmm. et cetera. But I think it's important for us to, being that we only have 19 slips, to you know manage it in such a way to where the, the slips that are, let's say, full-time yep. you know, people are slips that add value to the sponge docks in the community as a whole, not just somebody looking for cheap, cheap rent. Um, and then also make sure that we have, you know, uh, our transient slips make sense as far as how many we have and yeah. how often somebody can stay and, you know, yada, yada. So I think now that we have a brand new facility mm -hmm. and something that we can command a higher price for, it makes sense to go back and look at, you know, all things considered as it relates to generating revenue from the marina. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, yeah. Mayor and Vice Mayor, you guys have some great ideas with the marina. 
Uh, I know last budget season I brought this up to you, Mayor, that if we're losing money and we just invested a significant amount of money, which Vice Mayor reminded us about, um, I mean, I'm not against looking at leasing out the property if there's a business that's interested in it. I mean, I, I, like I said before, I'm open to evaluate anything, um, but I believe the vice mayor is on to something here, uh, and I think this is a good opportunity also for Karen, our economic developer, to focus on as well as, as part of it is really focusing on the growth of the charter business within Tarpon Springs. It's an, it's an avenue that we have a few charters currently that are there today, but it's an avenue that we haven't really touched i don't think as a whole for the city when you go to clear waters and these other destinations uh, i mean there's plenty of fishing off the coast of uh, the tarpon springs and people want to do stuff when they come to tarpon springs and if we had more charter boats here it gives the people that visit more things to do right mm -hmm. and then we're keeping them in tarpon springs longer hopefully they're staying in our hotels or bed and breakfasts or whatever it may be uh, and that's the idea so it's also an economic development or an opportunity to increase more foot traffic in the docks, hopefully more stays within Tarpon Springs and more money in our restaurants. So I would completely be in favor with what Vice Mayor was talking about was saying you require it only commercial vessels of some sort could be leasing it and also day rentals instead of just someone that would be putting their boat there instead of putting it in a dry dock or somewhere else. Um, but again, I'm, I'm open to looking at something. If there's an opportunity to lease it out somehow, uh, I'm open to evaluate that as well. But I think it's important to, to have charters there and to grow that charter, or recruit somehow, we, how we can do that to recruit as well, um, more charters in the area, and also work with that. Maybe that goes part of our advertising uh, for this year is um, the ability to go take charters out to catch grouper or whatever it may be. I mean, that can be a, a way to promote Tarpon Springs as well. Yeah, let's look at all these options there, including that uh, could be an incentive for uh, the Papas restaurant to be developed here, yeah. having that we have uh, the facility there. So let's look at all that and see okay. uh, if you have met Ms. Lemos to look and see what options we got. Well, of all, we got we go. a team that will look at it because it, yeah. it encompasses several different departments. So. Okay. Commission Donovan. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I just, a I know, I, sh I should be in the attorney's seat. <laughs> Um, I just had a, a quick question just to clarify. So are we saying that for the marina, we want to look into possibly making it only charter boats that would go in there? or um, Just a certain only? amount. Like, I mean, my, my thinking would be, uh, you know, they got the people who have the front or the slips that front directly on, like, go deck to me. So yeah. there's a parking lot there. But, like, you know, years ago, there was that was, like, charter row. People hang their fish up there. I mean, it was an attraction. You know, I mean, you go to many, you know, you go to Key West, and you see people looking at the charter captains throwing their, you know, fish heads, and it's just part of the experience. So, I mean, to me, I would rather have that activity there than, like I said, somebody looking for, you know, relatively inexpensive place to keep their boat who had, adds no value to, you know, what we're trying to do in this fun truck. Okay. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be more than willing to look into that as long as we had clear-cut criteria, like, you know, only these spaces or only this amount or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and also you have to be a licensed captain and you have to generate, just like we do with the city dock in front of the sponge exchange, right? You have to prove that you are a sponger. So with X amount of spaces at the city marina, you got to prove that you're a charter captain. you got to run X amount of trips a year or, you know, I mean, the criteria that we could set on it is endless. I mean, yeah. that would be my desire. <laughs> All right. We're good with that? Okay. Now we're moving to uh, stormwater. Well, stormwater, to me, is directly related with the seawater rise, and I'm glad that we're able to budget $2 million or 132% uh, without we'll be able to, fin to work so many different projects. And also, we've got a big grant on the uh, project to uh, Penn Street and Gross Avenue. How much are we going to get from that? 1.5, 1.3 million? Almost million four. Yeah, huh? million four or something. Million like one point three six somewhere. Yeah. One point three? Yeah. And the Toro is going to cost 3.2, three. so yeah. that's, it's a very good project. Uh, we should be able to do the, uh, the sea breeze sewer line, something that we've been waiting for a long time in a sensitive area. Uh, and also, they're going, we're going to do the sponge docks engineering for Seawall, $150,000. So, I think this is a, a very good, uh, very good account, very good uh, enterprise fund.
Vice Mayor, you got any comments on that? Uh, no, I mean the uh, you know stormwater stormwater projects over the course of the last five years are something that I think we can uh, be proud of. I mean, you know, just just to name a few where we used to have flooded cars like on the regular that we don't you know we no longer have. I think that we've been making some leaps and bounds, and in a lot of cases they're not easy projects. I mean, there's you know there's uh, to do them. In some cases we have to acquire land. You know, and it's got to be planned out. You can see that a $3 million project, we've got half of that funded through a grant. So I'm pleased with what we're doing in stormwater. And I look forward to the improvements that you mentioned as, as it relates to backflow prevention and not just in the sponge docks, but in other areas of town as well. Well, they finished two already, as you know. One on the Bay Shore, another one on Canal that you're talking about. Remember those? Yeah, well, there's, we also finished talked working about well. the, uh, right, Tom? They're both working well. Okay. And, okay. Yeah. and Roosevelt. I mean, there's, we, you know, just because I mean, we're doing good doesn't mean that we don't need to continue to do good. Of course, I mean, there's yeah. other areas yeah, that yeah. we got to look forward to because in some cases it takes years to have these projects come to fruition. So. But I'm good with stormwater. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Uh, can someone refresh my memory about the increase of 50 cents per ESU per year and remind me also what ESU represents? Tommy, you want to share? He gave me the honors. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's equivalent stormwater unit. It's, it was approved in a, after we did a stormwater rate study, I think three or four years ago. The rates are good through, approved through 2025 at 50 cent increases per year to cover uh, stormwater projects like this. It brings in about another 100,000 a year in revenue increases. Uh, single family home, They'll pay. They're they're paying seven sixty five right now. Next year they'll pay eight fifteen. So I'm not sure if that helps you any, but okay. Um, I'll f I'm gonna follow up with Paul a little bit more about the ESU and how that's calculated. I just that was before I think I was on the board, so it was I didn't recall what that was. Well, they came back. I think when they did it they, on the stormwater, the area, the stormwater, and I think it's based on the. It, like I, this, what's up fronting the uh, this, the roadway there, and I think it's based on I can't remember if it was like nineteen one thousand nine hundred and fifty square feet of linear frontage there. Maybe Paul might more more. How do you remember this stuff, Ron? <laughs> I'm struggling there, Paul. <laughs> I might be close. Gosh. I've been out of the stormwater game for about, well, more than five years. But yes, back in 2001, that was one of my first big projects was to do this study. And it's still carrying forward today. But the ESU, as Ron said, equivalent stormwater unit, it's a measure of impervious area. It's the area that the Driveway. rainwater can't soak into. So there's a standardized unit that they evaluate the average across the city. And I think it was in that 1,900 square foot range. So then um, what we voted on it with the public and, and it all worked out that they wanted to keep it simple. Any residential unit, no matter how big or small the house, will be counted as one ESU. Got it. But when you get into the commercial properties, then you start calculating it and dividing by that standard number and coming up with how many ESUs is that. And then multiply that times that rate. Okay. Great. Thanks. Uh, Ron, if you could connect or touch base too, since it's been discussed a couple times that the city's going to be receiving uh, around $1.4 million in a grant. Um, when that's received, how long is that before it's actually used? Can we invest that in a short-term CD and make some more money on it? No, that's going to the project that's already in uh it's well, part of the Pent Gross project. I understand it's that. Point two million. Once we yeah, receive it, or the city receives it. So they've already it. spent the money, so it'll reimburse. Uh, reimburse okay, so it's a reimbursement it's grant. Reimbursement. Then. Okay. Got it. Saying that if we had it in the over, in how much money could it generate before we spend it? Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. No further questions. Thanks. Commission Donovan. No questions. No questions. Okay. Next one is golf course. Another uh, enterprise fund that uh, we actually we spend a lot of money trying to bring it up, and, and it's nice. We get a lot of compliments now, but we need to find a way to increase the revenue, Mr. Liqueris. Uh I don't know, by uh, improving the, the restaurant, that will, you think they'll create more revenue or something we should consider? Yeah, liquor license. Yeah, we can look at that. Yeah. I know we 
we've talked about it sometimes before, but yeah, yeah. we can we can look at that. I don't know. I don't know what that would be or how long we'd start seeing the profits from what we put into it, but that's something we can look at. Yeah, with. yeah, because uh, um, increasing the uh, restaurant business, that's other things involved too. Mayor, can I ask a question? And all that. Yeah. What about um, leasing out like the rights for like a food truck every Saturday to a different type of food truck, and you get a percentage of the food sales? So um, you lose the overhead of the kitchen itself, but you've got the food truck in a certain area to where the golfers can buy something, and then it's a shared revenue source somehow. Yeah, could be we, an alternative for also have a very good restaurant that we don't use. You know, we had the, uh, some of the meetings there. Uh-huh. You know. But does uh, the rest, does the uh, tent pole have a full kitchen? Yeah, I think it does. Okay. Oh. No, we have a very sure. limited facility. Um, like a hot dog when, here. When, we met there when one time. We had a hot vice dog mayor hamburger. was there and stuff. He had a <laughs> a microwave hot yeah. hamburger, but you got to admit it was a delicious hamburger. Not a bad hamburger. He said it wasn't bad for what it was, but I think it was a microwave hamburger. I, be, I believe. <laughs> got a pretty good bar too. Yeah, the bar. Beer and bar wine. Beer <laughs> um, I will say Howard Hunt, our our golf course manager, has experience in his prior uh, work working at a facility that had a restaurant, a country club environment. And his experience was that part of the business was the biggest struggle to make it meet its expenses. And we're seeing even on a smaller scale at our golf course, the staffing challenges we're having to get people to want to come do that kind of job uh, to the point that we've got a vacancy that we still haven't filled. So even on the small scale of selling drinks and uh, sandwiches, um, you know, so to get into the restaurant business at the golf course um, would be quite uh, something to overcome. I would say I know there's a lot of nostalgia with uh, the golf course back when the restaurant was in full swing. I do think we had a different environment then. <clears throat> there's a lot of restaurant competition now that I don't think was there back then. I will say, though, that talking to Howard, the golf course manager, he is open to uh, suggesting we look at if we do bring this food service thing up some more, doing a contract type of approach. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's coming at it more from his experience with trying to hire the help and um, that sort of thing and not really seeing a big margin um, by the time he subtract the expenses out. And, and I don't know if it's worth looking at if you uh, rent the place for meetings and stuff like that to get some people. Um, I would say that as a, you know, I mean, it's obviously the restaurant business is a hard, you know, hard business with a big failure rate. But in terms of leasing the facility, if we did have a kitchen, now we don't really have a kitchen, so there's not much other than what's there to lease, right? But, I mean, in terms of leasing a facility, that's something that I would be, interested in and do a cost and do a profit share like what you're talking about with the food truck but only you know utilize the facility mm -hmm. to lease it right not the golf course itself we're still no, going to operate that but just the yeah. restaurant mm -hmm. that's something that i would be interested in um and then my only question regarding the golf course is in the in the budget i don't see any uh any government transfer so i'm assuming that a number of years ago the big renovation that we did we've already paid our we fully paid ourselves back now for that no we haven't um the golf course has basically had to take loans for all the improvements. And if I could just go back quickly, Ron referenced back when we leased the golf course. During that period of time, there was no investment in the golf course. So when we took it back, um, we had to build a new cart barn, a new right. maintenance building, upgrade the clubhouse some, to some degree, and then of course all of the grounds. We redid the greens. So we've accumulated a lot of costs and those are all loans. We've been paying back those loans with a surcharge on the greens fees. That brings in about 40000 a year. But um, that's taken a long time to pay back this 900000 or something that's outstanding. I really appreciate Ron looking at that transfer because um, that will allow us to, I think, make some headway on that debt. And um, I will say this, relatively, most municipal courses are relying on their general funds. They're almost like a recreation division where they, they have to contribute to keep the golf course afloat. That's very common. So for us, we actually do meet our expenses year in and year out for the most part, very close to breaking even or even a little bit ahead. Um, so I think we're doing very well comparatively, and I do understand that you want to 
clear the debt, and possibly come in above board a little bit if we can. And that's something that we are working on. So are we not servicing the debt this year? I'm sorry? Are we not servicing any golf course debt this year to the general fund? We have a loan with the sanitation fund, and I'm not sure what the balance is, but we're on track to pay that. I think it's about 40000 a year, right, Ron? 38000 yeah. yeah, correct. It's about 40000 a year. The balance at the end of this year will be about 160000 That's what we'll owe? That's a... I'm sorry. That's what the golf course will still owe from that renovation from years ago is 168000 Yeah, that was a loan that was taken, an inter, inter-fund loan that was done a few years ago. So that's the total golf course debt to the general fund? or To, to the, the sanitation, sanitation fund. fund? Well, yeah. That's not too bad because it was like a million four or something for the renovation, wasn't it? Well, there's, it, they're still in a negative cash position over and above that in the amount of about 982000 And who is that? What fund is that money owed to? That is just that's just a negative cash balance sitting in the golf course fund. There hasn't been a loan done for that. So yeah, can you explain that? You just have on paper there's there's a negative balance of nine hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. And that was from that. That's from all the ago. capital expenses that have been done over the years in the golf course and charged to the golf course fund. Mm -hmm. But we paid for that out of an account, correct? not the golf course fund, or we loaned the golf course money for that? Well, they loaned part of it when they did the loan from the sanitation fund, but the other part is just um, the, the negative cash. At the end of the year, the auditors require us to get rid of that negative balance, and we've been using the general fund, so you'll see, a net, you'll see the net 900000 coming out of the cash in the general fund when we do the year-end audit book. If that the nine hundred is owed to the general fund. Then. Basically, at the end of the year, when we do our accounting entry, yes, we get rid of that negative, and it's not done, done as we haven't done an official inner fund loan, but at the end of the year, for financial purposes, we clear out that negative nine hundred thousand by taking that out of the general fund. Does that help you? <laughs> yeah, to a degree. Is that annually, or how does that, I mean, can't we just write that off the books and then clear it, or is that? <laughs> I saw that thumb. I saw that thumb. <laughs> is that for me or Paul? Uh, he gave the thumbs up, but he's talking about can you just clear them, since we did all those renovations when we took over the course and it was a disaster, and when we ran it out. How can, can we I write think off the, those I books? think the intent was, you know, maybe we'd be able to recoup it with the revenues and the fees. And that's why, you know, we've been trying to decrease that interfund transfer, which used to be at 275000 So hopefully if we get rid of this, you know, the current transfer, which is this, this is the first year, we might have more revenues that we can reduce that 900000 that's sitting out there. This is year over year. It's like an accounting situation. It's not actual true dollars, though, right? Well, it's an actual, I mean, right now there's actually 900,000 negative cash balance in the golf course fund. But it's not really coming out. I know what he's saying. He said it's not actually 900,000 is coming out of the fund. It's so yes. We're not, take, we're not allocating $900,000 out of the general fund this year to the golf course, right? Correct. Okay. I want to talk about this further. It's one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> um, <laughs> gosh. That's how I do a lot of accounting things. But it's still money owed to the general fund at a certain point. Yeah. Right. If it starts make, golf or starts making money, that money it made would go back to lower that. Right. So this is years over year, like 20000 50000 60000 100000 year over year that was negative that pulled money out of the general fund, so it just hasn't repaid it back. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, most of it was from the renovation. Yeah. It's from the capital uh, projects that were done. Uh, I know one of it was uh, when they redid the greens uh, three or four years ago, and I think there was some major capital uh, years before that. I can't remember what it was, but that's what created the negative cash balance. Okay. Great. Thank you for that information. <laughs> Ron's been running an Amscot on me too, though. I think he's got <laughs> a 21% interest rate. <laughs> um, I, again, I want to connect with you two at some point about that further. Um, 
And it's just, just so I understand, today, though, the golf course seems to be breaking even the way I, I'm looking at this. And I, am I looking at it correctly? The marina and the golf course are like <coughs> revenue versus expenses are almost exactly, right? Well, when I check the audit book, usually operating-wise for the golf course, operating revenues, operating expenses, like golf course is tw a positive 26000 in last year's audit book. So usually golf course, yes, will have a twenty, thirty thousand dollar operating income. Okay. And then usually the inner fund that I don't want to complicate things more, but then the the admin charge usually fell after that, and that's what brought them into a decrease for the fund. But operating wise, they've been a positive twenty, thirty thousand. Okay, that's good to know. I mean, I guess you could look at an opportunity cost. Say, what happens if the city were to sell part of the golf course? You have tax uh, property taxes at that point you're bringing in. You don't have expenditures going into the golf course for investments. Uh, there's other avenues to look at it from an opportunity cost standpoint. Uh, I've been looking at it as a unique opportunity for the city of Tarpon Springs. It's a demographic that you don't necessarily, it, it may be a group of individuals that visit Tarpon Springs specifically for the golf course. And then um, the spouse may drop off the husband or the husband may drop off the wife. It could be either way. Um, to go play golf for the day, and then they go into town to have lunch, go shopping, go to the sponge dock or something along those lines. So it's a unique economic driver as well for the city uh, that people may not, that may be the only thing they know about Tarpon Springs. And I think that's one of the things I've pushed so hard for the updated entrance area with signage, walls, also looking at some um, old pictures of Tarpon Springs that go on the outside of the um, club or what do you call it when you go to go pay? What's that called? That place? Pro shop. Pro shop. Thank you. Um, to, to just spruce that up, and it doesn't cost very much to do that. It might be a couple thousand dollars, but just get some old pictures of the bayous, put them on the canvas, stretch them out, um, do something a little more creative to show the history of Tarpon Springs. Put a historic sign there. I know that's going to be coming up in another commission meeting um, as well. But uh, it, this the the golf course is what a lot of people in Pinellas County and Tampa Bay area know of Tarpon Springs. And then it's just another area that makes Tarpon Springs unique. Um, is it always the best idea to keep a, a public golf course? Probably not later on in the future, or maybe not later on in the future, but today, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see that it's breaking even. Um, and then also the Marine is breaking even right now too. So I don't have any further comments. Yeah. Thanks. Also creates, provides recreation to some, a lot of people too. Absolutely. Part of being a full service community. Yeah. Thank you. If I may add, too, we're also hosting two high school golf teams at our facility, wow. both Tarpon Springs and Palm Harbor. So there, there's a lot of benefits besides just the income. Yeah. yeah the intent. Uh, yeah, I think our municipal golf course is actually in really good shape. I mean, all things considered, it's breaking even. It's a pretty nice looking course. Of course, I'd, I'd you know, be in favor of beautifying it some more if yeah. we're able to. But we also have to temper our expectations, knowing that it's a municipal course, and we're maybe comparing it in our minds to the, you know, Cypress Runs, Crescent Oaks, uh, a lot of the privately or at least semi-private um, country clubs you got going on in East Lake. Um, but I'm I'm really satisfied with the way our, our golf course is operating, looking lately. Um, but again, yeah, if we can do anything to make it uh, more creative, then I'd be all for it. A little bit more revenue, be than that. Okay, what's next? Uh, internal services, we'll get anything? If not, that's all we have. Any other questions, comments? Well, that concludes the budget section, and it's adjourned at 9.52 p.m. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Good night. The rain stops, so it's a good. Yeah, relative. Did you hear the thunder? Yeah, wow. well, you hear